Hello and welcome to the grand finale of the Eurozone show. Spain and Italy may be struggling, looking frail financially, but on the football front, they continue to look in rude health. Very pleased to say as we look ahead to the final of Euro 2012, Spain against Italy. Got the stellar panel once more in place. Angus Lochran, football aficionado, statistician, also known as Stato, of course. Mina Rizuki, European football expert, writer, passionate Azuri fan. And Luther Blissett, <laughs> who, uh, along with the rest of our panel, picked England to beat Italy this time yes! last week. Um, Wrong again. <laughs> probably not wholly depressed, given your time at AC Milan, Luther, and, uh, and England. What have you made of the, uh, the Italian team who... Angus reminded me before we went on air, 14 to 1 at the start of the tournament, ranked 14th in the world as That's well. That's right, yeah. I mean, last week when we were talking about the what, 11 to 1, weren't they, with England, with exactly yeah. the same odds, weren't we? See, I remember that figure. So, <laughs> so, can't believe we got it that far wrong. Um, I, I think the Italians have been fantastic. They have improved game to game to game. Yeah. And um, you just see them getting stronger. The belief now, I'm sure, in all the players and in all the squad is that they're going to win this. You know, you, you can almost <laughs> see that. And they've got such confidence and belief in one another. And the penalty shootout against England was just amazing to show that. Yeah, especially then, given the fact they dominated the game. As absolutely. Well, because sometimes you think it's because going to go the other way, Yeah, you? you think, you know, it's going to all go against us. But, you know, led by PLO, which was a fantastic, great penalty. Still one of the best penalties. I, I mean, Ramos <laughs> tried, but I tell you, the PLO's one was just unbelievable. Um, I like that Ramos yeah. tried, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a little bit more on it than I think PLO's right, was yeah. very PLO's much. PLO's was just little precise, when it was just a little, the, the most sweetest little dink and that. So that was just... Outstanding. I mean, outstanding as well, because obviously people looked and they said, well, England are rubbish, can't pass water, let alone anything else. So let's take it in context that Pirlo's performance was against an English side that you know couldn't keep the ball. But then, you know, Prandelli and Pirlo in combination to, to destroy Germany and go and attack them. I know this final score 2-1, that must have been one of the best nights of your football life, was it? Yeah, it really was, especially because the day before we were walking around Warsaw and there was all these German fans who were heckling us because we were so obviously Italian <laughs> walking around. I was with Tancredi, so just imagine. Yeah. And they came up to us and they were like, 5-0, 5-0, <laughs> you know? And I was like, 5-0 to Italy, and I, you know? Yeah, and they yeah. were like, you wished, you know, this is the best German side. And I was just like, and I thought, you know what? they probably are going to win 5-0, or they're going to at least beat us by, by two goals. I thought that our defence was strong enough to not concede sure. more than two, but when we won, I, it was just, I was flying, because I just didn't imagine for a, a moment that the most beautiful German side I've ever seen, and I told you that they would win the tournament if the tournament was fair, and <laughs> football was fair. I don't think that any more Italy deserve no, this. They got, they, got, they got decimated. <laughs> I, guess the, I guess the final score was 2-1 on the night, but no it. team has had more <laughs> shots and only stats than Italy this course of this tournament. We were talking sort of off air and it's been a topic our producer's been flying around and we're a little bit younger. Don't remember the 1982 World Cup. Is it the most attacking Italian side you've seen or was that Rossi and well, Co? Well, were they perhaps well, I, even I, more I attacking I remember the 82 World Cup and what I remember about it was how poor Italy were at the start of the 82 World Cup and it really all uh, came for them in the knockout phases when yeah. Rossi got going and uh, it was a one-man show really but then when it got to the final they put in a, a great team performance and they, they, they were worthy winners against Germany. He also had a late penalty in that final to sort of make the scoreline not really what the domination was. Sure. I mean, you know, Italy were, uh, were worthy winners of the semi-final and to be quite honest, in, uh, in the game against England, uh, they were the better side by a distance. England didn't really show up and had England nicked that on a penalty shootout, it would have been as unjust in a lot of ways as the domination that yeah. Bayern Munich had over Chelsea in the Champions League final. And I'm not sure... You know, no one would have complained to have seen England gone through, the, the English supporters, but the better team on the night one, you just have to look at it and say, well played Italy. Yeah, Ashley Coles was a lot better penalty in the Champions League final than it was yeah, in that was, game yeah. as well. Yeah. Let's have a quick look at the uh, the route to the final. And this is Italy, and of course this was a Group C opener as well, when beforehand it was doom and gloom around the Italians, the match-fixing allegations, 2010 World Cup performance wasn't great. I think they lost three friendlies coming in, Mina, but then 1-1 against Spain and obviously went ahead against Spain as well and, and Spain had to drag it out a little bit. And we dominated is the that, how key was that? Mo how key was that game in terms of belief and you know in the, in the squad, do you think? Um, I think it was hugely important, but we, we sort of always are a bit confident against Spain because they find it hard to defeat us from yeah. open play, obviously. They, they broke the taboo when they actually beat us on penalties in 2008, but other than that, we're quite confident, but we are the only team, and I will stand by this, the only team that really took on Spain and said, you know what, we're going to actually play yeah. you. Uh, and they're with the only team that they m managed to score against them. They've no. conceded one goal throughout the whole tournament. 1920 is the last competitive match, I think, in not outside of penalties. You've, yes, you've, uh, you've exactly. lost to Spain, so it's incredible. That was the Olympics there. So this was the, the game and uh, Di Natale's goal. And at that point, you must have felt pretty confident, but 
finally Fabregas, and that, I suppose the key in this game was interesting, Luther, was Formation. the fact that the 60 minutes, the 3-5-2 formation, but the 60 minutes Italy tired and Spain came back into it, and that must be on Prendelli's mind a little bit tonight. Yeah, I think it will be. I mean, a lot of people said, you know, should they play with the three? I think he's just going to go with his back four. Yeah. Just go with his back four and just go with the organisation that they've showed in the games previous. And, and they, they should be fine to do that because they can deal with that within the formation that they're playing anyway rather than having to go. I think that was quite a good ploy they did right at the beginning yeah. because that really, threw I think it threw off. the Spanish big style when they went out and played <laughs> that, you know, because they found the Italians were just picking them off everywhere they were and then they was also hitting them with the long ball when they needed to because that's one thing Italy will do. They'll mix their game up. They'll play short and they'll play whatever. And that's why we kind of like them as Absolutely. well to watch it. It's attractive, well, what, what it? What they do is they, do, they, play, they mix their game up and, you know, I mean, I was just saying a little bit earlier, you know, he's, he's Prandelli's done for the national team what Saki did for AC Milan when he went there. You know, changed the sort of the mentality where they go back to play the game so they get a better mix of playing it long, playing it short and all the various well, bits Cro in Croatia between. game as well. I mean, Croatia came back at you. You get Pirlo with a free kick and then uh, Croatia with the, the equaliser. I suppose that was steady. And it, it then left it quite nerve-wracking for the... Oh, well, it was against the Republic of Ireland. I've just yeah. been in Ireland and they were admitting that their team, was, their team wasn't the greatest throughout the tournament. But there was nerves attached to that just because it was, it was in the balance with the Spain-Croatia Spain game happening at the same time. They did ask Del Bosque whether he regrets not having ties with Croatia to <laughs> yeah. not get to have the competition. <laughs> but, of course, he was said no. But, but what I wanted to say was that with those games, he did play 3-5-2. And that was mainly because, you know, he needed the great fitness levels. And um, he wanted to see the midfield hadn't yet clicked. And he wanted to go wide um, but once they started to understand each other once they started training more with each other he reverted back to his old yeah. system and he said I'm not even considering playing a 3-5-2 against Spain now and um, the problem with that formation as much as it's very direct and probably quite interesting to watch it tires you out it really does after 60 minutes you cannot the wing backs in particular because, guess, yeah, yeah. because you have to run so much and you have to press so high Whereas with the with the four at the back and you know with the four three one two, there's a lot more control over the game. There's a lot more of a rhythm, um, and that's what they've been used to playing in qualifiers. So, and I think that would be it's going to be interesting to see because they've done so much better with that formation than they have. Although they tend to start badly yeah. with it every time. As well. Before we quickly talk Germany, the England Italy game, Angus demonstrated that midfield success of the, the Italians diamond and just dominating England in there really in the rigidity of. England's, Absolutely, England's I mean, four, Italy four, were two. quite adventurous and uh, you know had a lot of good chances as well. They, they yeah. played a really good game against uh, uh, England. I mean, it's funny in how the two teams from the same group go through. We had that in Euro '96 as well with uh, the Czechs and Germany. And you, you look at Croatia, are going to say, well, well, you know, we've gone out to the two teams that made the final. And even the Irish, who didn't play well, can you know say, well, we didn't really have any chance in that group because no. the two that were in the group. Uh, Got to find Lenny. Anyway, B so. and C were a little bit tasty, <laughs> weren't they? The other two, even it's shown that throughout yeah. the course of it. So then Germany won Italy too. So people will look at that and say, well, the Italians have ground out another win against Germany, and Germany have got this hoodoo and no wonder they can't beat them in competitive football. But Luther Bliss, it could have been, what, 4 0, 5 0 yeah. at different well, the, times? The thing is, five, the five, thing, maybe give Germany yeah. a couple. They did have a couple yeah, of Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, you know, tactically, which is not something you can often say about the Germans, they got it wrong. I mean, they should have seen in the England game, especially, when they had the opportunity, they look to play long and yeah. get the ball get the ball direct with Balotelli because they know he's got pace, he's got strength, he's got great control, and we all know he can finish. You know, you look at his record in it's England. A goal made in Juventus. The boy can yeah. finish, yeah. you know? So. It surprised me they actually gave him the space behind so he could actually use that power and that of his to go and do what he did. And the finishing was just exquisite yeah. <laughs> finish. It was just amazing finishing. Just the, you know? the positivity all around. I mean, they were literally, we talked about Germany. We asked Raf Honigstein, what happens if Germany go behind? How do they react? He said, oh, don't worry about it, even though yeah, they've gone ahead exactly. in all the qualifying games. In the game. But, <laughs> the but then at the target, we talked Once about the defence. they couldn't recover. We talked yeah. about the defence, you know, and how the individually, if you run at them, and Italy seems to do that with the midfielders, Montalivo dribbling through, Marquisio dribbling through, and obviously Cassano and Balotelli. It just seemed that that positivity was, was well, so key. You see, this is the thing. I'm, I mean, I, obviously they had, uh, Greece said at the start, we didn't think we'd get two goals against Germany. So yeah. you look at them and you know that uh, they're not a bad back line. They're not nothing like the Holland back line. That, no. that was probably one of the worst I've seen. But they have weaknesses. And that's the difference with Italy. There is a balance. Nothing is spectacular, but everything is balanced. In, in Germany, their attack is spectacular. But there is Jerome Boateng, Boateng and um, Bath Stuber. 
they can be got at. And if you know where the weaknesses are, then you'll just do that. Also, Matt Hummels can be dragged out and you, he can be turned over. They haven't played him and Bad Stuber together because one plays at Dortmund, one plays at Bayern Munich. Yep. And it was just a case of identifying the problem and just going for it. And I mean, to be honest, but like Balotelli did quite well against Terry and Lescott, who were much, in my opinion, probably more solid more at suited, the back. Yeah, you know? more suited to deal with that with long him. ball as And well. he still managed against yeah. them. So he was the perfect player to sort of have that. Whereas they had Gomez, who does little for the team other than just really score goals and I've said this before and he and they sort of defended high up kept him up and he just couldn't do anything about it no. he had no way of bringing in the other players to, to cause problems for Italy and interesting Angus we've had our um, 46 years of hurt or whatever it is now for England but Germany now creeping up isn't it since Euro 96 the last tournament they've won and this was almost the peak of this, they're going to have a, you know they're going to be 26 average age in in two years in Rio, but it was seen as the culmination of a successful youth side coming through for Germany. But perhaps the mental doubts and fragilities, and, and jo Joachim Love changing his formation to try and counter Pirlo and the Italians. That almost seen an, an un-German sort of uh, mental attitude to the game. Yeah, big difference though, between 66 and 96. Yeah, yeah, years. yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> carried away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they've had they've had plenty of success, Germany. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they always get to the final four. Well, they they, they certainly. Uh, haven't been disgraced even since then. I mean, they, they reached a World Cup final, of course, remember, and, and deservedly so, played played well against Brazil in Yokohama in, in 2002, got to the final. They're probably against the odds. Not many people at the start were expecting uh, Germany to be in that World Cup final. And, you know, they, you know, they, they had a bad day at the office against Italy. I think it, it was un, a very unlike German performance. Yeah. Uh, it, normally, when they're confident and you'd expect them to come through, everyone really expected it there was the hoodoo factor everyone was talking about the fact that Italy had never beat Germany but I mean even you, the, the Germans didn't really think that was a factor because they thought they were the better side but on the night and that's what the beauty of knockout football is we've seen it time and time and again on the night, the best team won, and it wasn't Germany. Yeah, the cruise experiment didn't really I work. Did it? Did it bad? We kept the cruise. But I think well, it Tom, wasn't, Tom Cruise's marriage is going up in the air as well. But we won't talk about that. Later. <laughs> Let's talk about on a, on a serious note because Balotelli has been in, in sort of impressive form, obviously the, in that game. Won the Serie A three times. He's 21 years of age. Coppa Italia, Super Coppa Italiano, Champions League, Premier League, and FA Cup now in Manchester City. Um, but this is how uh, Gazzetta della Sport have gone with it. And I mean, Luther, what's your your reaction to this? Because the depiction of um, of King Kong on on Big Ben, not the Empire State, isn't it, or something I, like I that? I think the biggest, the biggest problem with that, and again, it's, I think it's more the Italian press not really appreciating yeah. how that is going to be conceived elsewhere. Yeah. That's mm. the problem. To them, they don't mean that in a, um, in a racist manner. No. no. But it, is, it would be obviously taken that way yeah. in, you know, everywhere else. And it's a problem that could have been avoided by just not going down that road if they'd given it a little bit of thought or, you know, about it. Because that... You know that wasn't that. Well, that's not a, a, an ideal sort of picture because we all know that the Italian players, and you could tell that yeah. they love Balotelli, mm. and the supporters you can see that they love Balotelli the way he plays. I mean, they see him as a major part of what their team is if sure. they're going to be successful. So, for the press to make that sort of error, really, it's it's, well, it, it, it is disappointing. Well, this is the headline yeah. in Tutto Sport. I mean, we don't speak it. I don't speak Italian. Uh, Leo Abbiamo Fatti Neri. Um, yeah, Neary being you. black will mm. beat them black, is it? it it's almost we like England will beat them yeah. black and blue kind of thing. But it's, it? a, it's a slang way in Italian of saying we've bruised them. Oh, okay. um, and it's just a pun on the word black, obviously, because yeah. he, he, it was a black man that did that to that's them. That's right, and that's something that used to... I mean, we people will say, oh, it's this and that, and it, but if you think back to the country... I mean, when I started playing football in the 70s and into, into the 80s, it was quite often the headline if you've yeah. had a game would be yeah. with black flash and stuff like that. So they'd refer to you as your colour first yeah. and then a footballer second. Okay, yeah. And it was a similar sort of thing. So well, like the American had the great white hope and yeah. stuff in America. Exactly. So when so Mark Chamberlain broke into the scene, I mean, the back page of the headlines, I mean, I still, it was said, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. That was the, one of the tabloids. And the other said, you black beauty. Yeah. Now, that's, that, that's, those that's, were the back pages exactly, of the English tabloids. Exactly, that's not, what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that's so similar to that. And so yeah. it's people not really understanding that can be offensive. Well, Jean-Luc Vialli, you've, 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 you've obviously played in Italy. Jean-Luc Vialli has said that, you know, he said, well, the difference is that England is a multicultural society yeah. for the last 40, 50 years in Italy. Maybe it's still, 
you know, not well, that well, way. Well, I think there's a lot of Europe is just sort of yeah. embracing that now. And, you know, they're getting to terms with all the things that we've sort of dealt with in the main in England. Yes, we still have problems here, no yeah. doubt about it. Um, but um, it's, it's not quite to the... On a positive note, this is a, the Italians, it's, it's, obviously, exactly. a crop field with the, I mean, an image of Balotelli. You're going to see this, you know, unless the aliens did it, you know. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's Balotelli and alien. It's very talented. But the tabloid yeah. press are going to love someone like Balotelli. I mean, look, in Manchester, he makes headlines every week, both on and off the field. And he's not going to change, is he? I mean, you know, and half the... Not immediately, no. But, I mean, he will change it, as he as he as he matures. He will realise that the important thing is his football, and the other things has got to be take second place. Do you think? I don't think he will change. He will do. He? because I he see will. I see him. I mean, you know, some of the antics he's got up, like going to petrol stations and saying pay, everyone pay on the fo- forecourt, I'll pay for the petrol. Yeah. Going into a, uh, handing out twenty pounds. Like a Robin, Robin Hood character. Yeah, but he will he will he will he will he will do less of that as he gets older because you just realise that it's not worth all the nonsense that goes with it. And well, you know, par- you, that's, you know, that's his sister, t- sister talking apparently is very, very shy. But uh, one Italian who's certainly not shy is our uh, Italian correspondent who sort of hitchhikes, gets all over the place, sometimes stays in five, five star hotels, sometimes sleeps on park benches. You are, of course, talking about Tancredi <laughs> Palmieri, who's uh, made a bit of a trip um, from Warsaw to Kiev in his own inimitable style. Uh, let's watch this video before we hear from him after the break. Here he is. So it's few minutes before 8 a.m. of Friday and Italy is in final since more or less 10 hours. The party is, is was just a few hours ago, especially for the Italians. But doesn't matter because we are here already ready. This is the bus. As you can see, you can't understand it, but it's big time. Kiev in Polish and Kiev in Ukraine, it's Kiev. It's the same tip that uh, Italy is gonna make to go to the final Euro 2012. So it's half an hour that we are traveling, so it's more or less 9 a.m. I already have been drive of two euros by the hostess. So as you can see, this is the big open space, 15 hours toilet that we had to share 50 people along the Warsaw in Kiev. I won't show you the toilet itself because it looks like someone just hit with the head because it's just so broken everywhere. But it looks like... Yeah, it's exactly what I want. My dear, some boys behind the seats. That is actually going since two hours. That we are trying, that we are trying to sleep. Two hours. Don't say again that Italians talk all the time. It's not true. Sometimes they are sleeping. Not, look at her. She's even tied with sunglasses. There's no way. Don't just don't repeat again that it's always Italians speaking all the time. This is the Ukrainian part. <laughs> now, I hope that you get as soon as possible in Europe so we can show you what is pasta. Pasta. It's pasta. not a pasta, it's mainly a pasta. Very good. Let me check. Oh, look, there is a kind of pasta spaghetti. Mamma mia. A Kiev, a Kiev. Ce ne andiamo, ce ne andiamo, ce ne andiamo a Kiev. A Kiev, a Kiev. Ce ne andiamo, ce ne andiamo, ce ne andiamo a Kiev. Of course, Germans, they don't sing this. So, finally, after 15 hours, we are arrived. We are at the fantastic uh, Kiev bus station, uh, as you can see. He is the brother. He's the brother of Shevchenko. <laughs> Ita- Parole italiano. <laughs> and the brother of Shevchenko. He completely saved my life because I had no phone working, no Ukrainian money, nothing. Completely saved my life. So see, even if maybe it could cost too much, come to Ukraine, you will find the brothers of Shevchenko. <laughs> <laughs> you. The 15 hour trip finished. The now we'll see if I will survive to go where I have to go. Thank you, Palmeri. Sports tonight live, uh, Kiev. 
Well, he's a great football reporter, isn't he? But what a man, what a character, what a story, what a, what a journey for, for Tancredi Palmieri. And just one of many over the course of the tournament we've witnessed, right, Luther. He too. certainly has a happy knack of finding the most attractive people in whichever he's country he's in. He's I'm going to I'm gonna have, to have, to have, to have to tag on yeah. to him, I think, is what I'm going to have to yeah, do. Yeah, it's not so good for me to tag <laughs> on <laughs> you, you, You've seen Tancredi out there, haven't you? You've seen yeah, we did work. one of these packages before Spain, uh, for Germany game. And, I mean, that took us about nine hours to do three minutes. And, of course, he chatted up about 15 women in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> so I know, well. And I'd be like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really not, sorry. Not to be an Italian stereotype or anything, but he's not. How's he going to get back? Has he discussed that yet? No, I don't know whether he's going to get back. I know he got back from World Cup 2006 to Italy by hitchhiking. It took him about five days or something like that. So we'll see how he gets back. But we will talk to Tancredi <laughs> after this break about Italy and perhaps reflect a little bit later about Poland and Ukraine and how they've hosted the tournament in the wake of Michel Platini's announcement that it's going to be hosted potentially by 12 or 13 cities around Europe in the future. Back in a few more moments speaking Italy against Spain. Hello, welcome back to the Eurozone show. The final one, of course, it has to be the final one because Euro 2012 drawing to a close, but hopefully a spectacular close tonight as Italy take on Spain, the two sides that shared a one all draw in the Group C opener. Italy with the mental hula as they had over Germany, though, with Spain. Only that penalty shootout victory in the quarterfinals for the Spanish against uh, the Italians. That was on penalties mm. in the last 90 years or something, Luther. Yeah, it's a long old time. It's a long time. And uh, I suppose it's the Pirlo question for any team coming up against Italy because we saw Roy Hodgson claim to have a plan after the game and said that they had an idea. But the fact that he seemed to stroll around in 20 yards of space every minute of the game suggested that Roy Hodgson's plan didn't work. Yeah. And then Yogi Love did go with the plan, but it perhaps disjointed Germany. So what do you do? Do you stick or twist? Do you play to your strengths in Spain or do you try and have a plan tonight for Pirlo? I think what you've got to do, you've got to take care of him within the framework of how you set your team up. If yeah. you go and set a plan out just for particularly one player, like a I man mark, yeah, I think yeah. you call yourself a lot of problems because you've then lost a player yourself. Yep. Yeah, you've lost the real use of one player yourself if you do that. So the best thing is you organise your team in a way that you take care of them within the way that you're going to play. And then at a possession, then you have, you have somebody who'll be close to him and say, right, you get close to him. You don't have to go mark him man to man. But you're the first one to go and put pressure on him so that you can stop him doing the things that he likes to do that will hurt you. Well, I'm sure a man who's uh, hoping that Pirlo doesn't pull a hamstring today or something like that is Tancredi Palmieri, who joins us now. I'm not sure if any beautiful women are in the vicinity. I'm sure they are. Um, Tancredi, fantastic to talk to you. Uh, we know you enjoyed your trip from Warsaw to Kiev. How are you feeling today? What is your, your mood? Because you, you're always pessimistic about the Italians, but surely even you must have some degree of confidence today. Buongiorno from Warsaw. Can you see the, shine, the sunshine? Kiev. Kiev. You're in Kiev, aren't yeah, you? You're in Kiev. Kiev. I'm telling you my feeling. <laughs> so, we're talking about Pirlo there. Do you expect Spain to do anything special to try and counter the threat of Pirlo, or do they, are they just going to play their game and then they see who, who, who passes the best out of Pirlo or Xavi and, and Iniesta? No, 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 no. Spain is never doing some uh, uh, particular marking. Uh, they won't do that about uh, uh, Pirlo. But the thing is that the best way to mark Pirlo, as has been showed, I think, along this tournament, especially in the first half against England, even if there are a lot of criticizing about England, but the first half about England, uh, defensively, I liked a lot. Uh, well, when you, when you keep... Uh, um, the, two, uh, the men that are ahead, uh, up in front for a team, you came quite close to Pirlo and then they are ready to be elastic, to occupy the, yeah. the area uh, ahead of them. Uh, if it's in that way, it's very hard for Pirlo to receive the passes. Uh, he, al he always has to run back something like some 15 meters and so start to play the ball almost from, uh, almost from outside the box. So that is slowing all the uh, Italy's building up. I believe that that way will be the best for uh, for, uh, for Spain, I, I honestly don't think that they will betray their philosophy. Not in the best moment, not in the, in the, in the right moment. Yeah, perhaps as well. The problem is that Wayne Rooney's fitness wasn't quite what it should have been, and that probably well, that, that created the space for Pirlo. No, right, you have yeah. to admit that Croatia did it spectacularly well, though, as well. I thought Croatia did a very good job of trying to sort of stifle Pirlo as well. But more, and more in the second half, perhaps, the other way no, around no, well, in, in that absolutely, game. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was the same job that actually Mandzukic was, uh, uh, was doing uh, mm. with Pirlo. And I, with England, I believe, more than Rooney was well back, actually that was always never f more far than 10 meters from Pirlo and Pirlo suffered that a lot when Welbeck went out then Pirlo uh, started to play again uh, with a uh, with lot of space by the way here I'm bringing you the main square of the fan zone of Kiev 
people are starting to roll around that are, that are so far more Italian than Spanish. Let me say thanks to Paul Davidson and Carmen that is helping me in this uh, building up of the show. The atmosphere is absolutely boiling. We, yeah. There are something like, uh, I believe, some 30, 32 Celsius degrees. Oh, wow. And there, are, there is the voice of the speaker from the fan zone already since half past nine that wake us up because actually, yes, we did a kind of a preview tactical party yesterday night. But you can already feel it. You can already feel it. A preview. Ta I'm sure it was a very tactical party if you were there. I'd like to see the guest list. So excited. Um, no, no, what other aspects of the Italian game has, have impressed you just generally? Just the attacking philosophy that the midfields, Montalivo, Marchisio, who has wowed you other than Pirlo? I don't, I don't I don't know if you can spot this uh, tactical Ukrainian. Ciao, Ukraine! Yeah. Oh, I knew I knew you spotted yeah. a woman because you just burned out. Well. <laughs> He's a it's, man. It's that, it's his next, your next analyst, your next co-analyst is there, uh, Tancredi. You are terrible, Tancredi. You are a stereotypical Italian, well, darling. Yes, today I am, man. I want to be a <laughs> Hey, this was the man who was in doom and gloom before yeah. the tournament and thought they'd get knocked yeah. out in the group stages. Yeah, so he's, pessimistic he, he's Tancredi. He's come, he's come alive. He's come alive. He's on a high. But Tancredi, what about... Yeah, you tell me. Is this, this the most, is this, I don't know, you know, Tancredi, I don't know how old you are, but is this the most Italian attacking team that you've seen, the most attacking Italian side? No doubt, no doubt. I mean, in 2006, uh, I think it was, uh, it was very uh, offensive, but uh, in a very, uh, I would say, uh, with energy, with pace, with intensity, with dynamism. Uh, this time is different. This time it's all about fine football. It's, uh, that, that was cool, fine football as well, but it's all about ball touch, it's all about possession, it's all about uh, one touch playing. It's I, honestly, I never saw, uh, I mean, uh, since I, I, can, I can realize the football that I'm watching, I never saw Italy like this. I think it's the one most comparable is uh, the Italy of 1982, or, well, maybe Luther can tell us about that, 1982 or Italy of 1978, that uh, in spite of winning anything, uh, is still believed by the football critics as the finest Italy, the, the, the Italy that played the finest football. I think that this is a, a, a great uh, uh, Italy that could be compared to that. I just hope they can go over that, uh, guys. I just hope that. <laughs> <laughs> and Luther, a big, obviously a big part of that is Cesare Prandelli, who's yeah. played five three two. He's played his. Two, what you've always espoused to me is like play for your strengths. You're positive. You always have. Uh, to. And Prandelli seems to have done that. He's done that, and I mean, I think I think the, the managers that are successful generally, that's what they do. They look at their squad and they, they say. What is the strength of this squad? And if you think your squad is your, your strength is going forward, then you need to also set your team up so you can be good support for doing that. What they're good at. It's no point having a team that's great going forward and yeah. you worry about defensively no, yeah, but because that just also, throws everything out. It is also because he's actually it's focused on technical qualities of players, mm. whereas Marcello Lippi did like his Simone Pepe's right. players who work hard, as yeah. opposed to ones who perhaps are very adept at but, playing. But, the but ball. also, if you just go for your favourite players, which yeah. is never the right, no, you've got to go right for a good to mix. Do. You got to go for a good mix of players that are in good form. And yeah, if they're in good. This form, is the first Italy together. that has a stupendous midfield, I would say. Well, yeah, you talk about the midfield and, and Tancredi talking about the Italian midfield. I looked at their ages; a lot of twenty-seven years old, twenty-eight. So they're, they're still going to be there in two years. But are you worried that Prendelli won't be there because he isn't? He hasn't he been talking about his lifestyle and wanting to be more relaxed and have more, more of a kind of a laid-back Italian lifestyle. Well, yes. Well, first of all, uh, uh, this is my point of view here from Kiev, uh, not also as uh, my <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul David, uh, CNN cameraman, warned me. Yes, he actually said to Walsh so, about it. Uh, he was just saying uh, that is telling you how much the pressure is going over us. Okay, so will Prandelli leave it? He said that uh, he missed uh, the club's uh, coaching vibes. Uh, I can understand that, uh, uh, but there is one thing. First of all, I think that after this uh, fantastic tournament, uh, uh, unexpected, uh, it probably uh, won't be so easy to leave this group. Uh, secondary, the vibes uh, the, of a World Cup uh, are something uncomparable. And honestly, I would be surprised. I think that he will miss. I think that probably he wants to try for at least one World Cup. But would surprise me if now or tomorrow after tomorrow, whatever, he would say, OK, for me, enough. Seriously, right now you met, you meet. The, the girl of your life, and then you give up just because uh, he's just so beautiful? No, you have to go on to the end. Of course, your <laughs> analogy is just not a woman. Yeah, that's an, an, <laughs> obvi an obvious it metaphor. It works, doesn't it? <laughs> an obvious female metaphor from the, uh, the Italian there. Um, when you talk about the other players 
involved, though. Mario Balotelli will, will get a lot of headlines, of course, after what he did against Germany. But the, the, what, what's your reaction to the reaction around the world to some of the images we've seen? We've talked about on the show already um, the, the King Kong-style image and, and things like that. Well, tell us from an Italian's perspective what that meant and, and how he's, you know, how he's sort of held in, in affection with the, uh, the Italian yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. I don't, let's not pay attention so much to that King Kong uh, Gazzetta comics because it was just a silly mistake, and that was all. A silly mistake doesn't deserve so much, spy, so much space in the headlines. We talk about that, now that's over. Now there is something much more important to talk about that. Talking about Mario Balotelli. He went through that line that is putting in front of the middle of the existence of every single person when the challenge is asking you, so are you going to stick? to all your fears or you're gonna win all your fears. Mario Balotelli went over that. His mother, that is quite old and that's almost never flying, went over the wall so just to see him and he felt that. You probably saw the picture of him uh, hugging the mother and the mother hugging him after the game. If, if you don't cry watching the picture, if your heart is, is melting, something is wrong with you, absolutely. That is, that was, uh, I, I think that made this picture the Pietà of Michelangelo. I, I honestly, I, I really can't see anything else uh, like that. Mario Balotelli has been able to fight against all the prejudices at the beginning, uh, all the talks of the tabloids, all the talks uh, of, the, the, all the, of the press that is sometimes uh, too easy in picking on something just because it's easy to pick on him. Why always me? Because it was just a boy, sometimes a bit crazy, yes, of course. But who hasn't been crazy 21? Someone <laughs> said, of course, well, from the, the madman himself. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> Tancredi. Tancredi, are you going to the game tonight? I'm sure you've had to pay a, a pretty penny even for a, a little room to stay in tonight. But have you managed to get a ticket for the, the final? And, and how is your heart going to be during the course of this 90 minutes? Do you want to kill me? Do you want to you make me this question? Do you really want to kill me? <laughs> I, ju I just can tell you, I will maybe in the tomorrow show, I will make it be upload this photo to you. That after the second goal of Balotelli at the Narodovi Stadium in Warsaw, I for some five minutes, eh, as long as seven Italian guys jumped on me after the goal, I just couldn't stand and watch the game. I had to lie on the seats eh, and just take a brief. It was like that. Tonight, I can inform you the, le the lowest price in the black market in the Tau stock exchange of the tickets eh, is so far. Eh, uh, 200 euros, but it's not that much at all uh, for a Euro 2012 final. Sure. Uh, am I gonna be in the game? You will discover just in tomorrow. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I look forward to discovering that. Take, we'll take credit. Discover in the, in the tomorrow, meantime, you know it's a 7:45 kickoff. What we want you to do? It's 30 plus degrees. Go and sit in the shade, have a cold drink, and Wait, try your on, best to relax. Tancredi, are you pessimistic or are you optimistic? Immanuel Kant used to say. <laughs> The moral law inside me, the sky over me. I really can't say nothing more than that. No, <laughs> no prediction. No prediction. It doesn't, want to, it doesn't give him the kiss of death. Tancredi, enjoy the game. Thank you, sir. We will, we will speak to you again soon. It's been a pleasure following Gabi your journey. Bella, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is Tancredi Palmieri. And we did, of what course, give character. England the kiss of death last Brilliant. week, saying that they were going to beat Italy. So perhaps he's, he's wary of that as well. So, guys, Spain doesn't tonight, want a right? Prediction. Yeah, we're all rooting for Spain. We're uh, all going for so Spain to win. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Las Rojas after the break as we continue our final Euro 2012 show and this team that just keeps on uh, motoring through tournaments, perhaps, though, getting a few critics uh, back in a few moments' time. Hello, welcome back to the Eurozone. The debate has already ignited in the break. We've had Mina Rizuki and Luther Blizzard finally discussing the number nine, the false number nine, the fake, the imaginary number nine, whatever you want to call it, the no number nine. Uh, Spain's lack of a striker and perhaps from Vincente del Bosque, a lack of a clear vision through this tournament, Luther, about how he wants to play. Is that, is that with Negredo coming in well, well, last well, game? I'm not, sure, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if it's a lack of a clear vision. I think they have decided somewhere along the line that the way they keep the ball and work it's on the sort of Barcelona image which you know but at the top of there when you play at Barcelona you've got Messi who yeah. is a bit exceptional. You can beat five players. There's with not a bit too of many yeah. of those around there that you can play and without the likes of Villa playing because obviously he's been injured 
then that's where they've really lost out in this tournament for me, which is why they don't really have that centre forward in the team. Yeah. There's nobody that can play that position the way that Villa has played it. And but they would be fantastic. a lot more because entertaining it, if they had Villa on. Is that because sure. Villa yeah, can definitely. interlink with the passing and have a penetration and, to his absolutely, game? Yeah. Yeah, he's but I got think that. Puyol does that too. I think Puyol is someone who knows how to initiate sort of attacks from the back. And I think that he is capable of sort of leading the line. And whereas you see the back line now and they don't have that going forward. They're, they're very much they're defenders. Quite, they're quite anonymous, aren't they, now? You a little bit, well, yeah. Five, yeah, five, Spanish, really five Spanish players have completed more passes than Pirlo in this yeah. tournament, which suggests, but it does sometimes... But it's just like, horizontal yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, people, they're, hammer they're, us, people hammer us for saying, it, you know, tiki tack is boring <laughs> and we don't enjoy it that much. But when you look at it and you think, it lo does look like we talked about a training session often where it's like, you know, it let's, let's get 20 passes and we'll, well get a free is, goal. Because the thing like is, that. you see, the thing is, when you play that, and if you go back to when England played them back in October, yeah. what England did, England said, right, when they have the ball, we'll get back behind the ball, defend deep, and let them come onto us. And they must have had 30, 40 passes before they got anywhere in, in the last final third of the England, of, towards England. And that's what they do in games. So, of course, they're going to have great possession, you know. But the thing is, is how effective you are with the possession. Do you actually get strikes at goal that you think that should have been a goal? Do you open yeah. your position up so you get the... That's where it really counts at the end of the day. And if you're not doing that, all the possession in the world counts for nothing. It's a little bit like like what England do when we give the ball away, trying to force things and trying to do you things. Know what? They're, they're like Luis Enrique's Roma this season in Serie A. It was all they did was concentrate so hard on keeping the ball. It was like, oh yeah, we've got to score a goal, don't yeah. we? And it was like, well, you know, come well, on, think about it. But this is very much the mentality now yeah. in Spain. It's like, you have to sort of keep the ball, but even if that means that the detriment of actually trying to but there is, it. I guess there is a tendency, of course, to nitpick when you have the world European champions, number one ranked team, trying to do what no one's done before and win three major tournaments back to back. So we do get a little bit overcritical, don't we? Always with successful sides. But when you look at their defensive statistics and maybe on that, the fact they've only had 12 shots on target against them in the whole tournament oh, yeah, and they've right. only had two in the quarterfinal combined from the quarterfinals to the semifinals. No matter how well you say Portugal did against them to hold them to the, the nil-nil and, and maybe attack them higher up the pitch, they didn't get a shot on target, and that's that's probably a testament to the passing. I don't know if that's a testament to the... Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but no. I don't know whether it's a case of Portugal didn't really do it that right either when it comes to striking. And Moutinho and, and Ronaldo are, are pros at sort of sky... You know, sending yeah. the ball to the well, sky they had, when they, they ought it. to be sort yeah. of keeping it, trying to... I mean, to Ronaldo sort of had a game in that match like Balotelli had at the start of the tournament. Uh, nothing he did was ever going to hit the target, or it was always wide, it was always over. It was one of those nights that he had, Balotelli's had one, and then... In the last game, of course, Balotelli had he hit his moment where he never looked like missing and scored the wonder goal. So, I mean, I've got a feeling, I know it's contrary to what's expected, but I've got a feeling that he might change it tonight. Really? Yeah, I think well, Torres, is, I think Torres is going to start for Spain. No, absolutely not. I know, so, it would be interesting. So, so, he's, be interesting. So, he's, so he's start without a striker. He's then played Negredo, who's come in, and, and, and then he's going to bring Don't back Torres, who did well against Republic of Ireland, mm. in due respect. So what does that say about Vincente Del Bosque? Well, he's, he's not convinced who's the best person to play up top. That's all it is. And yeah. I think in yeah. your team, you need to be settled and you know, because that position is quite a key role. If you're going to play somebody at the top, of the, uh, you, you need somebody got that, you, a long time that you, though, you trust. He? And, but it, it may have been a long time, but he's been trying to fill that with somebody that can bring the two parts of their team together, that yeah. keeping the ball and being very offensive when they need it in and around but the world. But I mean, you know what it is? They started, the sorry, they started with a 3-5-2, uh, Italy started with 3-5-2. They thought they were going to have a reference point. So it was almost intelligent that they started without a striker. Because mm. sort of the Italians started to panic seven minutes before the start. And, and Plandelli <laughs> spoke about that. And he said, we just thought, we don't have a reference point. What are we going to do? How are they going to play? What's going to happen? And it was, it was great. And then they saw that actually that worked because what they don't have is a striker that effectively works well with the team and how they move around the football. And Fabregas obviously having players with Iniesta and Xavi and there's a lot of the you know Barcelona yeah. going there. He knows exactly where to position himself, and it worked. It worked. It didn't work as well as Italy uh, did in the first half. But don't, but you, think Italy, don't you think Italy are going to think that's how they're going to play tonight, and that could be the trump card if they go the other way? Marca and uh, As and the majority of the press in Spain are absolutely convinced that it would be Fabregas again. Well, okay. we, we, but will will it will Prandelli worry about? That's the right idea. You say will Prandelli play to his positives, which is a strong, he, he, a strong he, he, midfield. He has got, he's got to play with the strength of what. What those players have, and because the fact that they have got, they've improved from game to game yeah. to game, and then the confidence that they've got through that, that's what he's got to go out there with now, knowing that man for man, if they perform as they've shown and keep improving like they, they'll give Spain a game tonight, and with what the added power they've got now with Balotelli at the top, hopefully now confident and looking like he's going to score 
again for them. Yeah. You know, they've got a chance. And we're still waiting to see Cassano. And you think of the shots that Cassano has had in the games that we've had. And has he scored yet, Cassano? He's scored one goal. Yeah, he's yeah. scored yeah. one Exactly. But I'm saying, but, but he's he only, creates he's, so much. Yes. And he has so many shots. Oh, I mean, so he must have had about four or five shots. What people him, don't then. notice about Cassano, I think he was absolutely splendid against Spain, is also his defensive work because mm. he knows when to drop deep. And, and sort of ruin the passing rhythm by actually working the channel so that they can't pass laterally. We'll, yeah, well, he's and the one that's going to one that's gonna get back to the like the Busquets and people like that. He'll get we'll around talk about them. the passing rhythm because obviously what Paolo, because people have argued that Slavin Bilic for Croatia got a bit of a, the handle on, on Spain, but maybe an advantage over Del Bosque. Prandelli mm. in the first game maybe outwitted Del Bosque tactically. What about Paolo Bento in the Portugal game? And the way that he set up, and he didn't just—he didn't do what you said that England did last year, set back. He pushed, and they pressed high up on Spain, and that seemed to fluster the, the Spanish. Well, I think anybody, when you put pressure on people and you're putting pressure on them nearer to their goal, yeah. whoever you are, you're going to be a little bit wary, especially if it's not the norm. And no, if nobody's done that to you before, it's like, what yeah. are they doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, and it throws you for a little while. But I mean, I think but then, for but me, then Portugal the, tired. Yeah, though, yeah but also yeah. on top of that, the Spanish were probably very thought. Let's be quite cagey early on, you know, and let's just keep the ball. Well, I think they were cagey for 90 running. minutes. It was only really extra fitness in the then extra time. They and then suddenly they kicked on and then we saw... But in extra time, they played some superb they did. football. They did. And they deserved Absolutely. to be winners on what they did in extra time. But yeah. You know, maybe there was an element yeah. of the Portuguese tiredness. But and also Ronaldo missing on the well, 89th minute. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. if that goal the had left gone foot, in, left foot strike the and I think that wide, really yeah. threw them, I think yeah. that, that not, had a psychological sometimes effect. It, well. Sometimes you see things and it just wasn't meant to be for Portugal. Portugal's problem is, in, through this tournament, just, just going off that, is they were lacking support in one or two areas on the yes. pitch for the likes of Ronaldo, Ronaldo and Nani. And Nani and um, Contrao and people. Yeah. You know, they were a bit short. If they had another two stroke three players of that they sort of ability, Alonso they, I tell you what, 10. they would have had, Absolutely. I think they, they, would, have they would have gone through. I think well, let's, bring, let's, bring through. In, let's bring in a sort of a Spanish expert, David Cartledge here, who uh, includes a Daily Mirror amongst some illustrious names on his CV. David, good to talk to you. Um, what has the feeling been in, in Spain after the, the game against Portugal and looking ahead to Italy? Are they as optimistic as they have been for the past five, six years or, or are they slightly nervous? Yeah, there's a, there's a degree of nerves there. Um, obviously, we've all seen Spain, and there's there's been little parts of their performances so far that uh, that everybody's you know, not too sure on, and uh, we're not too sure how good this Spain side are in terms of because well, we know they're very good, but we're not too sure how, in terms of have they got that extra gear that they can kick up to, and will they actually kick on uh, kick into that extra gear against Italy? So that will be interesting to see. But the mood, I think there's a bit, there's a few nerves there definitely, and. There's a lot of talk of Andre Pelo in Spain as well, and everybody seems to be obsessed with him, and he's the big figure for everybody. Yeah, Yogi Love was obsessed David, with him, wasn't he? David, yesterday I was speaking to uh, one of the writers or perhaps editors for Marca.com and BBC, and he wouldn't even have it. He said that Spain was the most entertaining team throughout this tournament, and they were sure to win. He didn't even seem slightly nervous about the fact that the Italians <laughs> could do something, which firstly made me want to kill him, but I had to keep my cool. Uh, yeah. Now, what do, <laughs> well, is that here. what it is? Do you think that they are so confident of their ability and their football? And they said that, if anything, we're just copying them. <laughs> Wait, another um, comment I, I wanted to guess. I don't think his, his, view, his or her views uh, represent... Uh, that of everybody, I don't think. There's, there is, there's plenty of nerves here. It's, uh, it's not a sure thing. If, if Spain had rampaged through this tournament and all their attack and might had been shown, if, if Torres and uh, Negredo had got five or four goals, you know, uh, Iniesta had scored as well, Silva had backed a few as well, and they won a few more games, two or three nil, then fine, that, that, that optimism would be, would be just maybe. But I think with the performance that Spain have been given, then there's bound to be a few nerves, yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, but I mean, the possession has been outstanding. Obviously, we've seen it as a, both a defensive and attacking mechanism. How good it actually can be. Uh, um, but yeah, as I say, the nerves exist. It's that, that doesn't represent everybody's views. The uh, nobody's uh, that overconfident. No, it's uh, that's crazy. But talk. it's interesting to talk about Spain defensively. They had second most shots in the tournament. Italy are first actually. So we talk about Italy being attacking and rightfully mm. so. They have been more so. They've got two strikers, haven't they? Italy that are playing well in Cassano and Balotelli. The yeah. difference is for Spain. We've been talking, David, about the conundrum. For Del Bosque that he hasn't yet solved about does he have a striker and if so who is the striker what what is the view from Spain because you haven't even seen one of my favorites Fernando Llorente used at all yet so far yeah exactly Llorente is the man who I, I would have liked to have seen start this uh, for Spain but with him it's been a fitness issue so in that regard I would like to have seen Negredo start uh, seems though Llorente wasn't available um, but I think against Italy I think we're going to see the strikers formation once again we'll see Cesc Fabregas in there 
Interesting. Do you yeah. think that? Do you not think that the fact that Tory <coughs> did so well against Italy? I mean, granted that they were exhausted by the 70th minute and they started to sort of not press very high up, which let Torres get, have three great chances. But do you not yeah, think I mean, that would have at all this. affected them to perhaps think maybe we should start out with him? Yeah, I mean, as I said, it's an interesting option. I just think, um, I don't think that Del Bosque is sure of what his best attack in the system is, especially in terms of the outright attack. I think the rest of the team, the way the rest of the team it does, it picks itself. Um, but with attack, I think with Seski provides the movement that maybe Torres isn't at the moment. And with Negredo, again, I just think Sesk's a more clever player. And I think against a very smart Italian side, I think Sesk will be, will be more, most useful. Um, other- and hopefully the, the mistakes that Del Bosque encountered, because Prandelli um, outwitted him completely in that game, or until the Italians tired. Um, so hopefully those mistakes have been learned. Yeah, Luther, it's a question mark, isn't it? Because a lot of these players are getting dubbed as impact players now. Because of Fernando Torres, perhaps lack of confidence as well yeah. in, in his speed and, and direct aspect of his game, which seems completely contrary to the rest of Spain, because they're anything yeah. but direct, they're all sideways. Absolutely. Well, is, it, is, it, is, it, is he always going to be better as a substitute for Spain? At the moment, I think in this, in this moment where the way they're playing, um, yeah, because the thing is, when you play deep, and you do have to play deep against Spain, because they keep so much of the ball, then the space behind... You need a clever player to get in, which is why we always talk about Silva, because I think yeah. he's great at it. I mean, Fabregas has got good movement himself, and it, but he's, he's, he doesn't do it in the same way. And uh, I think that's really is a problem. That's why they can't be thinking Torres in there. Whereas if you want to stretch them a little bit and, yeah. you know, use, you know, especially when they're tiring, that's when you stick a Torres in, because then you can go and hit him a bit earlier to try and get him in behind. Even, um, but will they tire then? with a 4 3 No, 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 no. no. Spe- I mean, the, the Italians won't tire today. They're no they, they, they doing a group they, game. They seem, yeah. to, they seem to have got they've that right. One they've, day they've got, they've got, they've, yeah. yeah, I know, but they've got stronger as it's gone on. Why? Because I think they probably, the belief factor, I think, has really kicked in more than yeah. anything else. And, you know, they think they know they can cope with whoever they're up well, against. What about on the other side of it? Because we talk about Torres perhaps stretching Italy late on if he comes on. I mean, but what about the perception of um, Balotelli and Cassano being able to to stretch um, the Spanish defence, because we saw them really go for Germany. Is that a fear in Spain that Ramos and PK may, may be circumspect if, if examined? Um, definitely. I mean, so when, when you look at things, they haven't actually been properly tested. I mean, against Croatia, they looked, uh, they were at six and sevens when uh, Croatia, they used a lot of width and they got the crosses in and there was a little bit of disorganisation there. But the other, oper- um, the other teams who they've come up against haven't really posed too much of a threat. I mean, look at Portugal. They didn't register a single shot on target. I mean, what is that? That's, that's crazy. And I, don't think, I, I can't see Italy doing the same. Um, I think Italy are capable, certainly, of uh, pulling Spain apart. And they're there to be pulled apart as well. But this ramos PK partnership that a lot of people say there's problems off the field as well, but that, that's not shown. They've looked very, very strong at the moment. But there's that caveat of saying that they haven't been properly tested. And Italy is certainly more than capable of doing that. David, just one word. Who do you think should win MVP? Most valuable player, would you say it's Iniesta or Pirlo? Uh, I'm going to go for Pirlo. Ah, oh, I love you. <laughs> David, <laughs> give, us a, give us a prediction before you go then. I know you sort of uh, follow the Spanish side of things very closely. Do you think they'll get this third tournament in a, in a row? Yes, this is a special team. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to say 1-0 in extra time. One nil extra time. Wow, they're Kiss putting a lot of penalties anyway. Uh, David, fantastic to talk to you. Um, Spain will be the first for them as well, for 90 years beating uh, Italy in a uh, competitive game outside of penalties. We'll catch up with you again in the future, sir. Enjoy the final tonight, 7.45. Very question, the question marks from Spain side of things. It's just mental, isn't it, how you approach a game, whether you, whether you do believe in your own strengths or whether you start to have worries about the opposition. But I think that's usually what it comes down to, ultimately, because... The, even in a one-to-one competition, you, you all know what your you know what your strength is. You yeah. pretty much know what the opposite. It's who believes in what they are capable of doing, and then can they actually deliver it when it's required in the game? And you know things will change because the games ebb and flow, don't they? You get a bit moment when the opposition's on top. Do you deal with that very well? And then can you then counter that by then getting above that, and then yeah. you can put some pressure. On? And that I think is the big thing between the players. It's going to be a massive mental thing for the players but also for the coaches on the side because they're going to watch it and they're going to have to see the players that are coping well with it and maybe one or two players that are thinking maybe they're not dealing with it very well and they might think we may have to have to have a change at some stage. Immensely mean expectation growing on Italy as well because they've been kind of the underdogs throughout, yeah. even, even bizarrely against England in some quarters. We're still the underdogs. I don't believe for a second anyone <laughs> really believes that Italy will win against Spain and I think that that's how we like it because without the pressure we're sitting there, we're, we're training with a happy smile. Prandelli seems to be at ease although he did admit that he didn't sleep very well and 
<laughs> when you know, usually he naps before every game. Um, but I, I do think that, that the fact that no one thinks very much of us and that we've proved ourselves both playing offensive football and passing game possession, everything, we, we are the surprise package. We've got nothing to lose. Yeah, confidence there as well. Prandelli having a nap for a game. That's so classically Italian, isn't it? Awesome. Uh, right, after the break, we'll reflect on the fact that Italy have spoiled the party because, of course, everyone tipped up a Germany against Spain final. We'll reflect on uh, Joachim Love's side after this short break. Welcome back to the Eurozone show. Adjectives like fragile, mentally weak, falling apart at the crucial times for once. Perhaps not talking about England, we're talking about Germany, are we? <laughs> what about that? Luther Blissett, a massive role reversal, the, the mental focus and strength of the Germans. And perhaps Joachim Love got a little bit unnerved before the game with his selection. Perhaps Germany were unnerved a little bit with the whole Italian record against yeah. them in knockout tournaments? Well, I think you do. You've, you've only got to, whenever you go into any game, you always look at it and think, so what's our record been? whatever because regardless people say I don't care about these things it plays on your mind that yeah. we haven't beaten somebody for so long they always get their upper hand on us in whatever so you've got that in mind and you think now how can we then go about turning that around what's the strength of my team what's the strength of theirs how can I get at this person that person all these things as a coach or whatever you go through all the time and then ultimately you think to yourself if their strongest are there I have to do something about that I have to address that now because that could be where we lose the game and sometimes you do that and you take your eye off the crucial thing <laughs> yeah you know, it's one of the most simplest things, like in, in that game. I do. Don't leave the space behind, because you leave space behind you, pace and power will exploit it. And that's the thing that let them down in that one game. And this could be a major thing, because we've just been saying that how many tournaments now that they've been successful in? Successful is in what? But how many Get, have they won? Getting to the final. You know, yeah. how many have they won? Yeah, and right. it comes to a point where you've got to say to yourself, yeah, they've got the semis, they've got the quarters, but then what do they do? When it comes to it, they choke every time when they get there. Well, let's, let's, let's get a sample of the mood from, mood from Munchen, the mood from Munich, because James Thorogood, writer for Bundesliga.com, joins us being a regular on the show. James, good to see you again. We're talking about mental fragilities. Is there a perception in Germany that it was slightly mentally fragile going into this league game? Um, mentally fragile, yes, I, I think so. I mean, there, there were several contributing factors for me that led to them losing against Italy. Yes, there's that mental aspect of them looking at Italy. And, and that was very much the feeling among the fans that I was watching it with at halftime. They're 2 nil down, and it was just a case of, we can't beat Italy, it's just something about them. Um, and it was an interesting one, but I think you've also got to look at, this was the youngest squad at this tournament. And we mentioned the fact that their backline was ultimately where they were at their weakest. Italy exposed that, they were tactically better, they played direct football and it was great to see. But then uh, the problem for me is that Germany didn't have the mental fortitude to come back into the match. Yeah. There was, they never gave up, but they, there was a real lack of fight back. There was a lack of ideas up front and so many of their shots came from outside the box. Their best three chances fell twice to Matt Hummels and once to Philip Lahm, and those are defenders. So I, came, I think that kind of tells you how it went down, really. Is it, is it, yeah. Um, sorry, James. Hi, it's Mina. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. <laughs> um, just asking you, do you think the fact that they didn't, you know, they haven't been losing and that they didn't concede first, or just that basically they didn't have the shock that Italy had with the friendlies beforehand, or perhaps, you know, we saw that with France as well, do you think that affected them because they're sort of riding this confidence wave and then, you know, they, they experienced an Italy side that they never thought they would? Um, mm. Do you think that is it? And second question is, sorry, do you think that uh, Yogi Love was complacent or he gave too much respect to Italy with his formation? Well, I mean, just to address the last question there quickly, it was pretty interesting. In his pre-match press conference, Yogi Love came out and made the statement, we do not have to react to anyone. And what does he do the very next match? He brings Tony <laughs> Force on and he reacts. Exactly. And, and that, was, that was a failure for me. And, and granted, it worked well against Greece. And I think the fact that they did so well against Greece certainly added a level of complacency to what happened against Italy. And you're right. Italy put them under a lot more pressure than I think they were expecting to, to face. And Tony Corsi he really didn't do his job, which was to take Pirlo and De Rossi out of the game. He ended up floating up forward and uh, <laughs> up front and trying to, trying to affect things up there. And, and I mean, it was an interesting one. Yes, Italy took them by surprise. Germany certainly didn't play their best football either in this match. And it was interesting. You mentioned the friendlies. They did have that 5-3 loss to Switzerland, which really took a lot of people by surprise. But then, you know, they've got the world record 15 games where they won in a row. And, and I think it was just, there was a, a level of entitlement. They almost felt that they should win. And that played on their minds a little bit too much. And as we said, when they go behind, they can't come back. When they go in front, they are really good at holding a, holding a result. 
But when they go behind, they cannot come back into a match. And I think that's something that Yogi Love needs to address. Yeah, hadn't gone behind, had they, in qualifying all this tournament so far. And we talked to Raf Honigstein about that before, about the, you know, how they would respond. They didn't respond too well, as you say. Quick quote from a former German footballer, uh, Bernard Dietz. He said, we beat ourselves with that lineup. That was an own goal from Love. With that, the team completely lost the plot. What has the reaction been again to the manager then generally for that? Has he been blamed for it? Have the players been blamed for it? What's the, the, the feeling in Germany? So I know he's been backed, hasn't he, Love, in his position by the, the German FA? Yeah, by, by the DFB, Jogi Love has got full support coming out from that, that camp. But the, the media has certainly attacked him a little bit. Now, I, I look at this and think it's ridiculous only because they've reached four semi-finals in the last four major tournaments. <laughs> You know, they, they've been on a great run of form, one game against Italy, who are an incredibly tough team to beat and, you know, a European powerhouse, let's be honest. I don't think they should draw, like, you know, jump to rash conclusions here. And I think Yogi Löw said the same thing. And the fact is, I don't think there's a better manager for Germany out there right now. I don't think there's someone that could come in and step in for Yogi Löw. And amongst the fans, I think the perception is that Löw's done a great job and it was ultimately the players that let them down. But the media have certainly had a little bit of a go at Yogi Löw. And I think that's wrong, really. No, fair enough. Why, why would you think that's wrong when they continue choking at the last moment and sort of not... I mean, they just threw everything out the window in the last 30 minutes. They were disorganized, they were chaotic, they were panicking. And that's yes. surely not the mark of a great coach or someone who can inspire them and, and calm them down and play their own game. France, when they witnessed, when they played Spain, they decided to change their formation and look how that went for them. So why on earth would Lou Gilav do that? And surely he deserves, I don't think he deserves any credit. I think that people should have a go at him because this is another semi-final well, where he's it, done this. the quality of players at his disposal is what you're saying, Mina. No, yeah, I understand. And I mean, he's not blameless. I'm not saying he's blameless. I'm just saying that I don't think his, ta well, I don't think he was the biggest problem on the pitch. I think, the, as you said, the players lost their heads. And granted, Yogi Love can be shouting on the sidelines to try and calm them down, but they were just, it was like they were just throwing everything forward in the hopes that something would work. The amount of balls that went into the box that didn't find a Germany player were, was incredible, really. And, and it was, it was panic stations for them. But Love, I think, as I say, I don't think there's a better man for the job right now. And he's undergone an incredible transition with this Germany team. He's taken them from being a counter-attacking team to someone that likes to try and keep possession. And granted, it didn't work against Italy, and I think he will learn from that. But the fact is, as I say, this is the youngest squad at the tournament. They're going to come back stronger from this. And 2014, I think, maybe is a little too early for them still. But wow. I'm looking at 2016 and thinking that's when a lot of these players that we've seen at this tournament will be in their prime. The Hummels, the Bardstubers, the Royces, the Schurlers. Mm. And I think Germany, in the next four years, will win a tournament. Yeah, and Yogi Love does cut a dashing figure and looks cool and composed on the sidelines, doesn't he, Angus? But we talked, I know you sort of poo-pooed it earlier about the 16-year wait for, for glory from, from Euro 96 for Germany. Let's put it in yeah, context to England. It is probably laughable to talk about the pressure. But when, um, when you talk about the golden generation there, and, and James is, is saying about the development of these, uh, the, these players in the age of 24, that pressure grows, doesn't it? Because in England, we know all about the pressures of a golden generation and the press expectancy. Yeah, I think coming into the, uh, to, uh, what, what James said there was very relevant, uh, coming into the tournament, the Germans were very confident. They actually thought they would at least get to the final again. And they thought that perhaps if they played Spain again, they'd give them a better game than they did in Vienna four years ago. That yeah. was the general view. Certainly when I was in Munich for the Champions League final, uh, when, when the discussion moved on to the Euros, well, Germany will be in the final again and we'll get our revenge and uh, uh, when it tournament, yeah. they, they, I I can't remember. You bet on them, didn't you? Tour. Bet on them. Yeah, yeah. But forget whether I bet on them or not. Uh, uh, the, the the main crutch here was I, I can't remember uh, a country being so confident as Germany were before a major tournament as Germany were coming into this well, tournament. What about how confident they were in 2010 when they released a song celebrating their win of the World Cup? <laughs> well, yeah. Or 2006 they, when they, they did, did it. They did it in 2006 game. as well. Yeah, in 2006. <laughs> they, they love they, that. And, the, and their match report, 3-1 against Italy. Yeah, that's real. Do you think yeah. that they're just, they're just, it's like they're not even superstitious? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I agree. When you're at home, you're entire. I mean, England were very confident in, in, in Euro 96. I mean, you know, when Germany beat England at Wembley that night, the, I mean, that, that was actually, I think, one of Germany's finest hours because if that match had been in Hanover and uh, uh, England had got a goal down you know, to a leading striker of Germany who'd scored, yeah. uh, uh, say Bierhoff had put them in front then, I don't think it, uh, that England would have had a prayer in that match. And you had to hand it to them. But it's it's a tournament they won. Yeah, we talk about sort of mental strength, though, aren't we, things like that. And it's interesting, James, to, to, Angus talks about the Champions League final, the mood in Germany at that particular time. But I wonder if the fact there is a Champions League hangover for players like Neuer, Boateng, Lahm... Um, Cruz, Schweinsteiger, Gomez. Is there a sense that perhaps they, I don't know, their, their confidence was rattled because of what happened against Chelsea? 
Yeah, we were talking about this on the on my Talking Football podcast in the fact that if they had won that Champions League, would things maybe have been different because you would have had a lot of Dortmund players that had just won the double in Germany and then you had the Bayern players that had won the Champions League and they're all coming into this tournament on a high. And it's interesting that you mentioned the, the confidence in Germany. Anything less than winning this tournament was going to be a failure in their eyes. I really believe that. And it's interesting. Granted, the mood after the Champions League final in Munich, you could have heard a pin drop. It was dead. You know, no one was partying. But after this one, people kind of accepted that they did deserve to lose against Italy and they were still enjoying themselves after the match in the middle of Munich, which I thought was an interesting reflection on the, the mood, really. German fans are, are often club fans before they're country fans, um, which is interesting to me. And the fact is Germany have a great depth of, of talent in their squad. Um, and, the, uh, you know, they're just, they're just a great team overall. And granted, it didn't work out against Italy. Something went wrong. There's so many contributing factors to me, you know, there are so many angles to take as to how they lost it. But the fact is they did. And that's what a lot of fans have said afterwards. It doesn't matter whether we keep getting to four semi-finals. The fact is we always fall short. I think they'll always be back though, Germans. I'd take it, wouldn't you? As an, as an England fan, I'd definitely take their form in first. Quickly, James, before you go, I know you're a, you're a Germany football expert, but give us a prediction for the, the final tonight, Italy-Spain. Um, I'm personally backing Italy to win it 1-0 in extra time. <laughs> it's fine. I think that's a, we've had that already, I think. Have we? Was it one of the extra times? Other previous way, other way around. Other way around. Other way around. One of Spain, yeah. So, interesting. There'll be 120 minutes of action tonight. James, thank you for your time both today and throughout the tournament. We'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks, Absolute James. pleasure. Cheers, Bye. James. Well, uh, coming back, we'll reflect after we've uh, talked about Germany's failure on Portugal's failure, or perhaps success in holding Spain for 120 minutes, whatever way you want to see it, and that penalty shootout. Why was Ronaldo last? Why was Bruno Alves not aware of when he should take his penalty? Uh, and of course, was Ronaldo a good penalty anyway? Is he their best penalty taker? Back in a few moments' time. Welcome back to the grand finale of the Eurozone, Eurozone show, even um, getting German in my pronunciation there. We are talking, of course, about Spain. It's reflecting on the tournament in general. And now we're going to move on to the uh, questions of Portugal and Ronaldo. We'll talk to Mina Rizuki about Ronaldo and her thoughts in just a second. Angus Lockram, what were your thoughts on the, on the Portuguese strategy against Spain and then, and then the penalty shootout strategy? Is a lot, has been too much being made of it and the, the question of leaving Ronaldo to fifth? Well, I think that was probably his decision, but I would, I would have thought Ronaldo would have been the player that had just gone up to take the first penalty and uh, set the agenda, really. I was quite surprised he left himself to fifth. But on the other hand, he was he was probably thinking if it goes very tight. But if it get, there, there's always a the chance you wouldn't get one if, you, if yeah. you go fifth. I think that was a mistake, a big error of judgment on their behalf. I think Ronaldo just had an off night with the shooting. I mean, he's a great player. He's had a fantastic season and he'd be my choice to be European Football of the Year this year. Uh, is he a great it. penalty taker though? Uh, he's he missed a few, but he's, a good, he's, uh, he's, he's scored many more than he's missed. He's not shy, he has missed one or two high profile ones, but you'd rather have him take one than if he's in your team, you, you must take one. Okay. Well, what, what wasn't the, fourth, the, big, the biggest fourth gap? Would have been, fourth would have this been a better isn't, place isn't, to yeah. go. Isn't the yeah. thing that you fourth get to taught that you, the, the most important penalties are the fourth, uh, the fourth and the first? Yeah. And that's when you should get your best penalty takers to they take them. make sure they take those. And, and it's not rigid, Mina, as well. I've heard a referee say that you don't have to stick to any particular pattern. So Ronaldo could have said, well, poor old Bruno Alves is probably mentally all over the place after yeah. he goes up and come me, back. I'll take the fourth one at that point. Just I know. Up. I mean, to put Bruno Alves as fourth as well, which is probably their most important one going forward. Yeah. I do think that, but he said... Bruno Alves had gone last and missed it. Absolutely. Been thing that too. Would, yeah, that would it, be, so hindsight's yeah. always twenty twenty. But he did say at the time, well, it was the coach's decision that I take the fifth one. And then sort of afterwards in the press conference, he was like, well, it was a group decision. Does so Ra we, does we don't does, really does know. Does Bento tell Ronaldo anything to do, though? Do you say but you know what? I blame him for missing that chance in the 89th minute. I mean, that yeah. was... There was just a lot of things that he did that was just a little bit irritating, and I'm such a big fan of his. But on the 89th minute, I thought that, that he really, royally messed it up. So how do we view Ronaldo's reputation, Luther, over the course of the tournament, his standing in world football? Of course, there'll be quite, you know, Lionel Messi will always haunt into his grave, probably. Yeah. But what, is he, is he enhanced I, his, his position? I think, I think he's, he's definitely enhanced it, because the one thing was people been saying he doesn't deliver on the big stage. And after the first game or so, he suddenly kicked into gear, and he thought, this... Yeah. Could be, and I mean, I, I think, like so many people, thought this was going to be his tournament. The suddenly the way things went, it just unfortunate they came up against Spain and they never quite got it right. A yeah, couple of free kicks over the on bar, and I think that's right. Yeah. you know, because I think it's not for a want of trying either with him, because you know what he's like. I mean, he's he was desperate to actually yeah. stick that ball in the back <laughs> yeah. of the net. You know, to, 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 so it was just unfortunate for him. What, what, let's bring in this Andy Brassel now. He's been with us throughout the course of the tournament, expert on Liga Sagres Portuguese football. Um, Andy, good to talk to you. Uh, what has the reaction 
in Portugal then? Because Cristiano Ronaldo's comments interesting because he did look devastated, but then he said afterwards, you know, we did well to get there. And the perception, I suppose, if you lose on penalties to Spain, it's never that bad. Is there Iberian rivals though? What's the Portuguese press made of the performance? People have been delighted with the performance because, um, especially the way they came into the tournament, they scored, they didn't win in 2012 in the three friendlies they played before the tournament. They scored one goal in that time, and because it was such a difficult group as well, there, there needed to be a perception that they were uh, coming into the tournament in their absolute best form, which which they didn't. And there were a lot of jittery people in the media who thought they wouldn't they wouldn't get through that the fans thought they wouldn't get through the group um, you know they negotiated it pretty well in the end they, they, they played pretty well even in the defeat in the first game against Germany um, so I, I think there's quite a sense of pride especially as the fact I think they were like just about better over the 90 minutes against Spain I mean they were absolutely battered in extra time I don't, I don't think anyone could argue with that yeah. but over yeah. 90 minutes you know I think people feel it was a sort of moral victory the, the one thing I always find a bit strange though people always say the players always say the media always sort of perpetuates this this thing about penalty shootouts that it's a lottery we had bad luck not we were badly organized we got the order wrong <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah there's, there's been no comment about there's no because of the English. I mean, the bizarre thing is the English press went, you know, mm. kind of exhaustive into the, the the kind of the tactics of a penalty shootout. What went wrong with Portugal? The selection of Ronaldo at fifth, but the Portuguese press hasn't really dug deep into that. No, not really. And it's funny what you were saying just before um, I came on, uh, what Mina was saying about how Ronaldo sort of slightly changed his story about how they <laughs> yeah. came to the decision of him changing fifth. Paulo Bento did the same thing. He said, um, uh, like in the immediate aftermath of the game, oh, yeah, well, ever since the training camp six weeks ago started, we've been practicing penalties, it's been the same order. And um, then in a TV interview on uh, Friday night, he said, oh, yeah, we just made it up at the end of it. <laughs> oh, boy, brilliant. Um, Angus, it's interesting because, you know, to talk stats, and we always bang on about stats with Spain and the fact they dominate possession, perhaps don't get as tired as the other teams. Is that something you take into consideration if tonight went to penalties, for instance? I think, well, fit. I mean, I was very, very impressed with Spain in extra time. I mean, I think fitness came into it. They looked extremely fit, whether or not it was uh, because Portugal uh, got tired. But... Uh, the, the Spanish extra time performance, uh, uh, you know, would encourage me uh, that if it went to extra time, uh, Spain would uh, maybe do a similar position. But I don't, I don't think Italy would want penalties. That uh, I really don't. I mean, you know, they okay, fine. They've had a bit of luck against England penalties, but in general, uh, it's been a curse, hasn't it? The penalty shootout for Italy. Yeah. And I don't really think, <laughs> yeah. mind you, but saying that I was in, I was in Rotterdam in Euro 2000, and I mean, I still my, my vision of that tour is still remembering. Uh, uh, the Italian bench jumping up and down. They thought they'd won. Yeah. I mean, they actually did. They were they, they were celebrating a victory, and then we went into extra time. And you, you know, obviously Trezeguet's got the goal. And uh, it, I don't think they'll be complacent tonight. I just think that one or two players that might one of, that that was a very very big uh, big night for Italian football. And yeah. it's not often we've not often seen scenes like we saw of celebrations. I can't recall it. I've never in a stadium. I've never been as aware of a team actually mm. celebrating to have won when they hadn't won before is that night. Yeah. It was also the time that we saw Totti chip a penalty in exactly the same way <laughs> well, pen that yeah. uh, Pirlo did. Yeah, I know. But and he, then he, Ramos trying to follow suit as well. Which is, uh, uh, absolutely, but this was, was a fine, this, did, did, yeah. did, did, this, this, this was a final on a neutral ground in a, in a cauldron of a stadium, which with the De Kuyp is in Rotterdam. It's one of the great, I think one of the great venues in, in world football for atmosphere. Yeah. And, and, and it was a, it was a hostile, no, it was a patriotic, vibrant atmosphere with you know equal support from both sides and you know really hardcore French and Italian for uh, footballers there that night and, and it was it, 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 it was exciting and I think you know hopefully we'll get we'll get an exciting game tonight let's hope so yeah it's just interesting and I thought with England fatigue as well against the penalty shoot against Italy I thought England players look too tired to take something they even yeah, kick it right. but uh, Andy quick quick word on I know Mina probably wants to talk about Ronaldo no, I just wanted to ask you that do you think that they would have done better had they had a, a, say a proper number 10 even a proper number nine or a player in midfield who's say a little bit more creative um, I'm not really sure that's the case. I think um, given that, that they were completely happy with the tactics, given that Ronaldo was completely happy with the tactics, which has to be the key, and he was playing <laughs> where he was most effective, uh, that 4-3-3 that three, three is fine. I think that the only um, way that you could say it possibly let them down, because I think they had that perfect balance in the three of uh, Veloso, who had a great tournament uh, defending, and someone who can pass as well. 
uh, Moutinho in front of him, who, who could go box to box and uh, play the right balls. You're expecting Modelis to make more runs into the box, but as often seems to happen with him, because he's such a multifunctional midfield player, I think he got caught between a few stalls. He didn't get into the box enough. He didn't have enough shots. We were talking about that Ronaldo miss. Well, you were talking about that Ronaldo miss um, at the end of normal time. The ball was all wrong. It was quite an easy ball to play. And fair enough, you'd still expect Ronaldo to hit the target there. But he was expecting it right in front of him. He had to reach for it a little bit. Mm. And uh, I think that really Good summed point. up their tournament, almost but not quite. And how's Ronaldo been received at, back at home then? Is he, yeah, is he are they a hero, a hero for his performances during the tournament? Yeah, people are very, very pleased with him. I mean, they're, they're always delighted um, that, that, that he is Portuguese, that, that he's one of them. They're very, very proud of him. And I, I think, as Luther was saying before, just the, the effort he puts in, you can never criticise him for that. You know, he might over-try a little bit sometimes. <laughs> uh, but you, you know, you, you can't criticise him for, for the way he leads the national team. Alone. Good good PR for uh, Madeira as well, I know, because the Portuguese always got funny, exactly. uh, funny views on the island, haven't they? Even though it is a beautiful island, I have to say, for my time there. Um, Andy, reflection, because you've been out of the tournament, Mina's been out of the tournament, Angus has been to the tournament. Reflections on the success of it, especially in the context of uh, what it's done for Poland and Ukraine in, in terms of a shop window, and then in the, in the context as well of, of Michel Platini's grand vision of a, a globe-trotting European Championships with 12 or 13 cities he's, he's sort of thrown out there this week. Well, it's, uh, I think it's been something to savour because it's the last 16-team tournament, which is, is something I'll miss. I mean, maybe I'll be proved wrong because there were lots of good teams who um, missed out in qualifying. Belgium, who people hope will grow into something. Uh, Turkey, Bosnia were almost there automatically, and they ended up losing out quite heavily in the playoff to, to, to Portugal. So, you know, maybe some extra teams um, will add a bit of something. I think Poland and Ukraine, especially Ukraine, from what I've heard, I was only in Poland, um, carried its logistical challenges. Uh, a lot of colleagues are sleeping on the floors of trains and all, all that sort of stuff, which, you know, is getting in the spirit of it, you know, yeah. getting down and um, But I, I think as, as, as far as, like, the welcome that, that, that people receive, I, I, I don't think anyone's had any problems with that, either, either media or fans, really. Um, Poland, especially, have, have been fantastic hosts. And I, I think it was disappointing, again, to see the host nations go out so quickly. But, you know, where we were... Um, the Polish people, once Poland were out, they really embraced Portugal. And um, the, the, the people in Poznan really embraced Ireland uh, when, you know, so many Irish visitors came to see them. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think, you know, Poland really got involved with it. And, uh, you Poor know, Irish fans. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. a, about how it would be, but, but, but they were great hunters. Well, Mina, what, what did you make of it? Because you obviously went out and spent some time with uh, the Stella Tancredi Palmieri yeah. on the streets of, of, of Warsaw. But this is it, I was saying, Andy, because I went to war, and like, I just thought that it was really deserted as a town, and I thought that there would be a lot more people. And I felt like most of the time it was sort of ghost town, you know, like, there were some... Well, no locals or no fans? There or? were locals in the old town, and there were locals in the malls, but just walking around, like, outside a hotel, it would just be pretty much me, you know, and, yeah. I, and I'd be, like, looking for people, like, looking for a huge number of people in the fan zones. There wasn't any of that, and I thought that it, perhaps if it was just Poland, where people weren't constantly flying out, because, you know, Obviously, I was also there during the time that the semi-final was being played in um, in uh, Ukraine, yeah. and, and all, people had flown out, and then people were coming in, and you just felt like it was, you know, one minute was really full, one minute was so, really so, empty. But, that, but that's the state of flux between two cities. So perhaps is it better to just have one city because rather than the twelve or thirteen, or, 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 or not one city, or one, one country, one, one country. country. Yeah. This is what yeah. I think. Then that way you have it there. You know, you don't know what the prices are going to be like. They're going to be ridiculous. But I mean, I just thought that it would. I just didn't expect that. I thought there'd be a lot busier. I thought there'd be a lot more people there, a lot more uh, but, attention. Buzz, yeah. But I didn't get that. So when you're getting that, you know, you're paying all this money to have the Euros in your country, you probably want a lot more visitors. And Angus, you're talking logistically about the fact you couldn't even hire a car between the, the two yeah, countries. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with the car hire is that you can't take a car from Poland into Ukraine if you've hired a car. And you yeah. can't take a car from the Ukraine if you uh, uh, want to bring it into Poland. So, I mean, that actually does make uh, the, the two countries not quite work. But as cities, I mean, in, certainly in Poznan, I know they, they could not believe the Irish supporters. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, they'd obviously heard that Ireland was a, a country where people used to like to party. And when they arrived en masse, <laughs> uh, they witnessed it in their own scene. Yeah. And uh, the alcohol consumption there, I'm told, uh, exceeded even the most optimistic of uh, Poznan hotelier. Well, I spent some time in uh, Cork over the weekend, and I can tell you, yeah, the enthusiasm for partying and stuff is is very much well and alive in Ireland, despite the performances at the tournament. Andy, what do you make of that? Then is it Platini just being sort of uh, provocative with what he said, and 
because surely the, the, sort of, the sense of dislocating it from a particular country and venue will, will lack a, an, an identity, won't it? Well, I think it's about exploring options, really. Um, I, I guess the thought is that there's always a certain bullishness at the end of a tournament. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's gone well, therefore let's forget about all the logistical problems, which there inevitably were. And I think Mina's point about, um, you, you know, that there not being that, that, that life because there's sort of the dispersal, I think is a, is a pretty good one. I mean, it was really quiet where we were, but we were in the middle of the country, so. <laughs> You've got to expect that, but definitely people going away and going going out to the game, and you know how long it took to get everywhere. I, th I think was 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 a little bit a little bit tricky, and um, you know I think that obviously from a cost perspective for the fans is is a little bit difficult, especially in the sort of economic times we are at the moment. Um, I, I guess the, the the thought is about getting more people involved, which has always been. Platinese thing, um, but I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if it, it, it panned out like this. Um, but I, I think it, it sort of co-hosting can work, but it's just the size of the two countries. They're absolutely enormous. Yeah. And, yeah, I don't, um, I don't, I don't think they're going to have any problem, Andy. It's like they get some sort of like pay down benefit, some sort of lasting benefit from the tournament being there. So he moves it after France and his yeah, home country. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in, fr in, fr in France, I know that he's, he's moving to 24 teams, but I don't think there'll be too many spare tickets for any game in France because, uh, um, you know, I think it's going to be a tournament where uh, literally once they put the tickets on sale everyone will go because it's a country which uh, all the other uh, hubs can get to quickly and easily yeah and the facilities are incredible already yeah. as well i mean they've, they've got most of the new stadiums done already yeah. and you know what we four years away and the culture yeah. the culture as well andy give us your magic moments of the tournament let's talk about the football side of it what will live long with you um from this tournament um i, I think Looking at the final, uh, Spain-Italy, I think, was the first really outstanding game of the tournament. Yeah. Uh, two brilliant goals. Um, Pirlo and Iniesta having such major parts in them. And, you know, they've gone on to be two of the, the key players of the tournament as well. Of course, Balotelli in the, in, in the semi-final, that was a pretty special moment. And the fact that, looking at the back at the starting where we began, I suppose, with the penalties, uh, with Portugal-Spain, um, Cesc, he, he always comes through for Spain. Yeah. <laughs> Future, future Spanish captain, without doubt, which I think is incredible considering he wasn't even the first choice going back to two years. So you brought us on to Cesc Fabregas. What are your thoughts on um, the Spain-Italy game tonight and the uh, kind of tactical selection problems of Vicente Del Bosque? Um, I, th I think they'll go with a three again. And um, like the, the, the three with the false nine, it, it has to be Fabregas. They were, they were far better uh, when, he, when he came on. And um, I think the, the, the challenge was different when uh, Torres came on it in that first game um, because it, it was about you know, inconveniencing a, a, a three-man back line that had been very, very comfortable up until this point. Now, I, I remember speaking to some of Portugal's defenders um, in, in the week coming up to the semi-final. I was so surprised they went with Negredo, not just because it was Negredo, but they, <laughs> they went with a proper nine yeah. because all, all the Portuguese centre-backs were saying, well, it's, it's, it's fine. If you've got a, a striker who's coming on to you, you can deal with that. If it's someone you've got to go out and get, you, you don't really know what's behind you and you don't really know how far you can come. And now Italy are back to a back four. Of course, that's given them a lot in the attacking sense um, with the full-backs, especially Balsaretti, who's been great since he's come in. Um, I, I think it will create that, that climate of not quite sure. And, you, you know, we've... We've said before with uh, the, the Iniesta and uh, the, the Fabregas goal, it can work. It really can work. Andy, give us a name. Winner tonight? Spain. Spain. Spain to win it. Andy oh, Russell. Andy. Tough for, for a man associated <laughs> with Portugal as well, your Iberian rivals. Andy Brussel, been fantastic to speak to you this morning and, of course, throughout the uh, duration of the tournament. We'll catch up with you again soon, I'm sure. Pleasure. Enjoy the game. We will, Thanks, I'm sure. Andy. We'll talk more Euro 2012, Spain, Italy. Reflections on the whole tournament in a few moments' time after this short break. Back on the Eurozone show, your Sunday morning football chat throughout the course of Euro 2012. We are building up to Spain, Italy, of course, but we are going to reflect on the tournament as a whole, our best moment. It's been fantastic from start to finish from the very first weekend. We had the first show and we're all being excited about it. But let's talk about the, sort of the standout moments then at, at this stage. Um, Angus, start with you. What will live, well, live with I you? Mean, I think the, the standout moment for me was just when that ball got put through to Balotelli <laughs> and uh, yeah. bang. I mean, I was expecting that ball lovely, to be. I was expecting that ball to be in row Z of the stand, 
And when, I mean, it was a great shot, had a great view, it went in. And then when you saw the slow mo replay from behind the goal, and you realised no goalkeeper in the world would have got there. And his, yeah. his reaction was, well, it reminded me of the goal, uh, 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 the reaction he gave uh, to Old Trafford when he got that goal for City against United earlier in the season. And suddenly, for him, the demons had sort of been released. I mean, the first goal was great, but the second goal was, was pure. Uh, well, it was, it was in, in my opinion, just a classy moment on the big stage. And it was the defining moment of the game. It meant that Germany were going to have to come from 2 0 down, and that wasn't going to sure, happen. Sure, for you, Mina, there's a lot of moments around Italy, but Ronaldo finding his form against the Netherlands in the final game. You're a big Cristiano that fan. That one. I'm also a big Zlatan fan, so definitely yes. that uh, martial arts, brilliant uh, kick against France. I thought that was the most beautiful goal of the tournament. Um, of yeah. course, Balotelli's uh, second one was outstanding, but more than that, the way against he, Ireland as well. Against Ireland, while he was being fouled, um, which is, uh, has to be noted, but. Also, him hugging his mother when in celebrating, <laughs> and he, he gets embarrassed, and he's still 21, doesn't want to be seen with his mom. No. And uh, his mom said that actually, and he, she said, That's he's why I was so proud that he's he came up to he's me. He's a boy, that's yeah. what we he's really like that. And he said, I did this for you my hug, mom. You'll hug your mum in pride. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. but my dear, tell I you, don't know uh, her in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I think in Italy, the, the mum's uh, pretty important. And we talk about that, that, that emotional moment. There was the Ukrainian lad in the crowd after Shevchenko scored mm. a double against uh, yeah. Sweden, and there's that sort of emotional side to it. What's What's stuck with you? I tell you what. I'll tell you the moment that, that got me was the in the um, the Poland Russia game. Yeah. When the captain scored that goal for me, oh, yeah. that yeah, was just one yeah. of those. Yeah. Because again, there's a story that goes with that, obviously, yeah. with his upbringing and everything else that's come on, and it it was just it was it was just the most. I just thought it was just a great goal, and what a strike as well. By yeah. the way, it <laughs> was it was yeah. one of those. The moment he hit it, yeah. you knew it was in, and. It's the way that it, it was just one of those flowing movements just went right from one end of the pitch to the other. He cut inside and it was a great touch, by the way, that put it inside. That touch when he changed the angle of the ball and then he hit it with his next touch. That was just fantastic. I'll tell you what, an emotional side as well, Mina. You probably appreciate it as a journalist because we're used to England, very kind of cliche, standard, you know, formulaic answers and in interviews. But talk to Zlatan Ibrahimovic, one of the best quotes was, who do you think is going to win the tournament after Sweden? And he says, I don't care, I'm going on holiday. It was brilliant. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Buffon. When talking about the strategy for a, a possible penalty shootout against England, after Joe Hart said, "I take you know my my computer to bed and we'll go through all yeah. the previous ten years," he says, "I go back. Yeah, I just go home and watch na naughty videos in my room." <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, but that's it's not it's nice to have that kind of un. Formulated yeah. thing, isn't it? You probably shouldn't. Joe Hart shouldn't have said he studied it because that's why Diamante got him. Because right. Diamante always keeps it tight, and Buffon told him go wide because this guy's been studying for the last two days. Mm. So let's try to shock him. Yeah, and it was. Stu but studying it as well seems to be a bit weird. And then he did all well, the funny, well, funny well, faces well, and stuff, well, which well, will well, stick well, with a lot well, of people. Well, I know that. I know that. I know that, all that. But I mean, all all goalkeepers look at who they might be up against in penalty. Yeah. They all know pretty much where someone's well, going to take Forlan the Forlan used to alternate patch corners every time, didn't he, I think, or something like that. It was a real clear strategy. To, yeah, to and you, you know, and you can work it out. Me, when I used to take penalties, I'd just make a decision. I'd often go to the goalkeeper's right, yeah. and you just hit the ball hard and make sure you hit the side netting is what you try to do with it every time. And as long as you did that, the goalkeeper, no matter who they were, never going to get I think you did it every time, didn't you, Luther? Do, quick, quick, quickly. Do you think uh, a lot of players actually don't decide until they're actually running up? Some do yeah. decide quite late, because a lot of them are getting... <laughs> so there's certain players and the ones that do it well and can take that slow run up and have that little pause and then do that, that's fine. I find that the best way, make your decision, turn, strike the ball. Bang, Surely you can't, you can't make your decision to do a Ramos or, or a Pirlo, can you? This is the best 11 of Luther's team from the tournament um, so far. I think goalkeepers, Buffon, Luther talk us through it. It's, it's a well, no-brainer, well, was it? Well, the thing is, the goalkeeper, I think, if you're looking, if you're looking, this was the team was going to play in the final, you'd want somebody with who's been there and done it and whatever. It's only 30, it's only 34. Exactly, and you know, you can't get anybody more experienced than what he's done, you yeah. know, for me. And so it goes with that, plus he is a great goalkeeper. I've seen him from when he first started and, you know, a great goalkeeper. And you've got Lam, you got Lam playing right, right back. Right back, yeah, because I mean, he can play right back, left back, centre, half, midfield. I mean, he can even play midfield. I've seen him. He's been mm. fantastic when he's played midfield. What a player he is. So, you know, great flexibility you have there. Um, then you've got Chiellini, stick him at centre half, because. Yeah, goes without saying. You've got a good partnership there with those two in there, Bonucci and there. Oh, I'm so well, let's, well, let's let's let's, let's contrast your team now with with Mina Razuki's and see if there's any uh, agreements there. I think Pirlo for most people will be there. Buffon. I mean, any, any, any 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 tough decisions for you that? Yeah, you I, I, I wasn't sure. Alba or Kilini, uh, No, never. No. It was always for me. It was always. I, I had a very good game, but Pepe I thought was outstanding. I think he gets uh, no one really really. I, for me, he's one of the best centre backs right, in the world. Explain. 
Um, I, I love him as a centre back. But I thought he was brilliant. I was uh, didn't know whether to go for Kalini or him, but I decided not to make it too Italian based <laughs> uh, to show that I am actually quite partial. Of course, Iniesta has very had a beautiful tournament. One of the best players in the world, if not the. Uh, and I thought Hedera, if anything, he really wanted it, and more than any other German, he I, really I came, wanted I came, it. I came very close to putting him in my team. I did come very close to putting him in. Well, we did. We, 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 we got, we got spectacular strike. You'd against, appreciate this. Uh, you, had, you, sh you showed a lot of restraint and not uh, not having too many Italian players. In there. I One, did. two, three, four. We had a tweet though when this was put out on at Sports Tonight TV on Twitter from a Mr. Anconchi, which Anconchi, I guess yeah. Anconchi, which I guess suggests his his heritage. And what you got Buffon, Alba did make it into his team. Bonucci, Chiellini, Lam, Pirlo, Marchisio, De Rossi, Montalivo, uh, Balotelli, <laughs> and Cassano. So that was uh, you know not biased at all but they, from that Italian uh, bank. Oh well, he's, a, he's here's, a awesome. here's my best eleven. I had to go with Buffon, Lam, Chiellini. Ramos, I thought, has played pretty well. I thought the penalty. Really, was he was good. embarrassed by. Uh, yeah. But I thought he did against Ronaldo. He did quite well in the, the last game. Yeah, he did well against um, Ronaldo. And then Ozil, Pilo, Gerard. I thought just because he was head and shoulders above any other England player in the. In you the didn't tournament. want Iniesta though. I yeah, how could you not have Iniesta? I know Iniesta's had twelve shots, hasn't scored yet. So is that good or bad? <gasps> it's I don't always know. that English mentality. Yeah, no goal yeah. means it. It's, it's, it's got to be a bad Angus, quick, your quick thoughts on our teams and any con controversy or anything. Well, well you it's just add? interesting that Buffon, Iniesta. I mean, Iniesta's not in your team, but Buffon, Iniesta. Uh, Perlo, Ronaldo yep. and Balotelli. I mean, there's really only six places up for grabs. Those six, five seem to be in everyone's uh, selection. So uh, we're all really in agreement that we've had an outstanding goalkeeper. We, obviously, Ronaldo's an outstanding player. Perlo and Iniesta have been magnificent yep. and Balotelli's come good at the right time, a bit like Paolo Rossi did in 82. Well, that's the thing with Balotelli. You had to have him because of the semi-final performance, didn't you? Well, let's look at the worst 11. This is Luther's <laughs> worst Brian. 11. I think there's going to be a familiar really? team Check. here as well. Yeah. Do you well, really think so? Well, well, in this last well, game? Well, well, the reason, well, Russia that's, that's the last game. The, the problem is, you see, the, the expectation and the standards that he set himself. It's all relative, The moment it? you fall below that, then you know, you've got to get punished for it, in my opinion. Right. And that's one of the reasons why even Van Persie, who I think is a great player. But I'll tell you what, it was Luther, difficult for him to play. I look at that yeah. and I wouldn't mind having that as my team. Exactly, that's, that's what I mean. I'm saying. But, I'm saying, but, <laughs> but it's relative but again, to expectation. But it's, it's 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 expectation, what you wanted people to perform, because so you know, with everything they go, and they turn up and it hasn't happened. So, Nina, because you could, of course, pick, no, not to be disrespectful, but you could have picked like half the Czech Republic, half the Irish team, couldn't you? Yeah, but I you wanted to put the entire back line from, of the Dutch one with Jethro Williams as well, but I thought, you know what, no. I agree that Luke Young's been disappointing for England. Young. I he, thought he, he well, has actually, terrible, um, yeah. and I thought he was well, embarrassed he by the Italians. Um, Robin, of course, Benzema, Maluda, I thought was, I mean, in that last game against yeah, Spain, he didn't know whether he, he, why he, he even played him. Yeah. He even played him, and he just was like, he just didn't know what he was doing the whole time. I thought he was. Um, I'm sad about Benzema. I really thought he'd come good. I really still did. got time, is he, to come? If, if France get through to the next um, World Cup, of course, I just that's don't think they've got a tough qualifying group. With, I think um, they've just got too many problems within the squad. Yeah, which, it's, which, it's manifest, that, which it's you that. can understand. Not Laurent why. Blanc has resigned. The last why, the, why the manager's gone? You know, he's thinking, do I really need this? You know, get back to club life. This is my worst team. I went with the Czech goal relative to the expectation. I thought Parker was limited in terms of possession. I thought he was central midfield. Really? I thought England struggled a little bit. I thought he ran out of gas a lot, which may be just the way it is. Now, that's too bad. John, John, <laughs> That's the where I got just because Bastille got exposed so badly against Italy for me well was immobile. <laughs> Terry for me, and this is tactically Luther, I was talking about Base. people have yeah, people have talked about his great assets and then mm. diving and blocking stuff. But it, I think the problem with England's strategy was having to play so deep and that was because they exactly, couldn't play further forward. See, I think blocking and stuff like that is great when you're playing at club level because it's all about that. But when you play at this level now, where you, you yeah, you have to do it occasionally. Yeah. But it, you know, I think so it could be a problem. Be more when you disappointing been eleven rather than worse. Than yeah, 11. I think I it's mean, not the worst because you could, you know, yeah. you could be yeah. very harsh and pick yeah. the team. With well, that's why it's yeah. difficult to actually pick yeah, it. Yeah, because then you know, would have picked the Irish, yeah. a lot of the Irish boys yeah. as well. Yeah, because yeah. they just. Let's talk about coaches then. Best and worst, Luther. <sighs> Best, Prandelli. Yeah, just because you've got to from, be, from the yeah. off because of where they started, where they started, and what they've achieved all the way through. And now the expectation is now in Italy. They're going to win it, and you, that, that was never. I mean, you've heard the Italian supporters they're saying, "So, I can't believe we've got where we are." Yeah, it's just um, amazing. Never and thought so, so. I, I think you've just got to look at it and think to yourself, "He has done a great job," because nobody. And you've got to think before that, players that went home because of the um, the usual little yeah. Italian problem, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> scandal, you know, yeah, as yeah. well that they've lost. So where they started and from and where they are and now. Worst, do we agree? Bert van Marwijk would be the worst. 
for me, yes. the best for, for me, Marvin hands down. I yeah. think that he didn't know. He didn't know whether they were an attacking team or a defensive team. He played with Van Bommel, and uh, yeah. when he should have played, I think Van de Vaart from the start. You know, play to your strengths. You are an attacking team. You're terrible defensively. Let's just go and outscore the opponent and see what happens. Group Prandelli best. I think yeah, Prandelli. I mean, you know, from what they went for, Luther's right. I mean, I watched the game against Russia pre-tournament, and you know, in a way, it reminded. I mean, it was an object performance, but I look back to. Uh, Euro 2004, and I saw Greece play at Holland, and you know the the mood in Greece was just uh, we yeah. cannot win a game, we're going out. So I'm not. I, I, I've ended up now thinking that those two games typify that you just uh, uh, rule out friendlies in the t game before the tournament. Especially for the yeah, Italians, well, they well, never take yeah, them. Well, I think the friendlies, yeah. the friendlies are big examples there yeah. of teams that could go on and win it. I think England have got six in the world, basically through friendlies, haven't they? That's why the rankings that tend to work out. Right after the break, guys, it's going to get very embarrassing for me in particular because we're going to talk pre-tournament predictions oh. on the Eurozone show and how they've come to bear and I think most of my uh, worst team have, uh, have been tipped to do well by myself but we'll talk about that in a few moments time. Hello, welcome back to the Eurozone show, reflecting what we've seen at Euro 2012. Of course, looking forward to the final between Italy and Spain as well. And Mina Rizuki said a very cogent point, I think, just before the break, that hindsight is 2020, <laughs> Mina. And uh, if people wonder why I ask the questions and don't answer them, it's probably going to be seen in our pre-tournament predictions, guys. Because <laughs> um, we, we've all been a little bit surprised, haven't we, particularly by how well... Italy have done. This is Angus's well, prediction, that's Angus Lochran to start I mean, off with. I mean, Ireland was a bit of a joke, really. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, he told me they could win it. Uh, well, no, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I fancied Germany and, 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 you know, they got to the semi-finals and on the day the, uh, the Italians put in a, a, a great a great performance. Had a nice little early run with Lendowski, but he didn't progress forward. I, that's what I fancied at the start. Three of the four went, yeah, three of the four went out in the yeah. group stage. Disaster. Disaster. <laughs> But um, Schweinsteiger oh, started well, didn't he? Schweinsteiger, perhaps, yeah. people could argue towards the end of the tournament, one of the disappointments after one a fast start. Um, this is Mina's predictions. Uh, you've gone through Germany, Spain, and then, of course, France have... You know, I know, I really thought yeah. that they'd win it. I also thought Klose would be top scorer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Has he played? Well, <laughs> yes, he's played. And I believe that if he played against Italy, he would have been good. No, best, <laughs> best player, Franck Ribéry. We haven't even mentioned him in disappointments. We were talking about Benzema, but I don't I think... Know. He looked very surly and... He was in my team for disappointing. It was yeah. the only team, mind, yeah. yeah. Good call, Luther. These are my predictions, then. Uh, but you know what, Italy? Yeah, I thought... I had Italy to do quite... I thought they'd do quite well unexpectedly, but I didn't tip them to get to the final. I tipped France uh, to roll... Not roll back the years, but a new generation to kickstart for France. Best player, Sami Nasri, is possibly the most horrible prediction of all time. <laughs> in France, He's been so disruptive. Yeah, yeah well, so disruptive. Yeah. They, they want to ban him for yeah, two years. Yeah, predicting to a, you know, insult a journalist would have been a, a more a kind of accurate <laughs> prediction. Yes. Um, but it is it's difficult, Diva. isn't it? But it's great. It shows you in a way what a success the tournament's it's, it's, been yeah, that, we didn't, that we didn't know. Do you want to hear They didn't put mine up because mine was correct, was well, it? I think, well, Luther, yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. Luther was playing golf in La Manga, us. but it assures, assures do, do us. Do you tell you us, mine. Well, my, mine was this. That I thought the team <laughs> that would get through to the semis, I thought it was going to be <laughs> Italy, yeah. Germany, <laughs> Spain... Oh, that's what I think the other one might get there. Portugal, perhaps. But yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah I thought top goal scorer might be Balotelli. You ah, know. I amazing. Thought, I thought maybe mm. the finalist might be Italy, Spain, perhaps. Well, hold it there. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, don't, give, don't, don't, give us, don't, don't give us your winners just yet. Um, but Angus, you mentioned and you're obviously odds and you're into your betting and keeping across those markets and things like that. Um, the bookmakers just didn't see this coming, did they, Italy getting to the final? Well, no, 14-1 to pre-tournament was a great result. I mean, funny enough, it shows what a difference it was. The, the, on the nominate, the finalist, there was, uh, most people just went with Spain, Germany. Yeah. That was a, a repeat. It, and favourites don't often win. It just proves that they've had a, a, a nice few shocks. We've had a nice mixture of favourites winning a few shocks, plenty of goals, one very disappointing semi-final, one great semi-final. It's been a good tournament. This is where the goals from the tournament have come in. Interesting here, this is the flags, if you can't quite see them at home, where the goals oh, are scored. Wow. You can see the furthest one back. Interesting, this is apparently Theo Walcott's goal against um, Sweden, the one that sort of flicked and went straight past the, the keeper. 
Uh, we've got Pirlo's free kick out left there. Yeah, they're all from, most of them are on the left side actually. Is it, or is it towards I mean, the a lot of headed goals in this tour, don't I think? Yeah, um, you know, oh, far no, more than one. you'd expect. Uh, uh, it, that was that was one of the surprises. And it's, it, it suggests perhaps attacking play with width, doesn't it, Luther? Yeah, I guess it if you does, get yeah. quite a few I think, headers. I think teams have looked to get behind the opposition far more, and there's been a more, lot more direct running at players, which has been great to see. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the crosses have come from, which has obviously made a lot of goals. A couple Look of at where England's of ones are. They're so close to goal. Yeah. Yeah. Look how far, you know, how deep the d d team's defended against. A few see. Nicholas Benter there with the Denmark flag as well. Might confuse Germany is all in the same area, the central area. Mm. Yeah, and also the Russian ones at the edge of the box. So we talked about Russia yeah. disappointments, perhaps. Zagayev, uh, Pavlichenko in the first yeah. game. They played so well, didn't they? And then they, that must be, you know, Dick Advocat must be one of the biggest disappointments with his coaching performance, I suppose, mm. of the Russian team. Greece but are all dotted sort of around. Not, yeah, but, but it's, good, it's good to know because you, you watch goal scoring and you tell people, which is why you always say to centre forwards and yeah. forwards, and kids should look at this, where the goals happen. They always happen in and around the penalty area. That's yeah. where goals are scored. Yeah. And you get so many no goals. No Denver Bar's goal again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Apart well, from that one. Well, no, commit, if we commit. had Giuseppe Rossi, I can assure you we would have had a few three minutes. Giuseppe Rossi, yeah, of course. If not in the, uh, the screamers. Tournament. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's talk, you know, a lot of people have big television rights and they have goals, don't they, things like that. We thought of the classier route, though. An interesting perspective on some of the greatest moments of Euro 2012, goal scoring and goal saving, uh, sent to us by Richard Swarbrook. Uh, who you can follow at Ricky Leaks on Twitter if you're interested. And he had this to show. And guys, we'll probably replay it, I think, because it shows you some of the key moments of Euro 2012. And, and here we go, some of the, the goals in string. string. All made up in string. Wow. It's quite impressive, isn't it? It is. That, that is not bad, is it? Is it Lewandowski the first goal, I think? So here we go through the rounds. And interestingly, whether you can spot, spot them. That's Who was that? Jaleel Lescott, that one. Jaleel yeah. Lescott. Look at the movement as well. It's exactly it's, it's funny the way it very, fell through the air like that, wasn't well. it? Yeah, fantastic. Even the goalkeeper's it movements. It's very clever, isn't it? Yeah, and this off the line off yeah. or yeah. over the line? Yeah, well, that's off, it's off the line. It wasn't the goal, was it? So no. it can't be over the line. And that, Rafael van der Vaart, we think that left footed strike there yeah. finished the box. Ronaldo header. Yeah. I mean it. And then, and what's that? That's oh, the Pirlo yeah. chip. Oh, the Pirlo chip. That's a great way to finish it, isn't it? And really just captures oh, the such a really captures the sort of feathered slight Very touch. Very creative. Okay, that. But you talk about yeah. penalties. You cannot. You cannot see so people say make up their mind and don't change your mind. Pirlo cannot go there. Say I'm going to dink that. Can he? He, he must made make his, his mind he up. He made his mind up. He made his mind up for me as he was walking up. I'm going to do this. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I, listened, said to, it. I listened to bits and pieces about it. He said so that you, you can't wait. You don't wait he, for the goalie to move. No, or no. He, he decided. I mean, he's obviously seen what he's done. He's seen the goalkeepers diving early. Yeah. Making it, which most goalkeepers do. So he, he did, decided. He's upsetting a lot of my teammates because they are. He's putting them all off where he's playing. So I'm going to have to redress but, the balance. So what he's gone and done yeah. is, how can I do that? And so he's yeah. gone up as if he's going to, and then he just that little one, and he dived out of the way, and the ball's gone in the goal. And, and, he and said, I wanted to take him down a peg. confidence just. Back and and as, Ram as Ramos watched that then? I mean, Ramos has said he watched well, it. Well, yeah, I mean, Xavi you know. and everyone at the time went on Twitter and went grande Pirlo, like, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> and Ramos had been sort of thinking about this before the tournament, that if they had to take a penalty, he was like, I want it to be a great penalty. Yeah. And uh, and he said that I wasn't sure to do it. I didn't want to practice it too much in case it word would get out. That's yes. how I would do my penalty. Um, and of course, his was He's very got good. His nerves are still in the goalkeeper's stand. Well, it is, but also, it but also the other thing about it, we know now, especially in this modern times, goalkeepers don't wait because they don't wait now for no. the ball to be it because they're allowed to move. Yep. So invariably, they will go well, early. A goalie looks silly if you pass it yeah. to the corner. But and you see, Buffon there. is actually one of the goalkeepers that tries to stay up the longest before before choosing which side to go. He doesn't go down early. He tries to, as long as possible, stay up there to put it's off a high the, risk uh, strategy. That it's a, it is a high it? risk yeah. strategy. Guys, let's, which let's, is why he's probably not that good at it. <laughs> well, Pillow's been one of the successes for me because he has been high risk in terms of you know keeping possession. Maybe five Spanish players have got more completed passes than he has, but he's gone that risk. He's gone those little dinks, and he's, he, that's why you like to see a bit of fantasy to it. So to culminate, panel. Let's have our thoughts, predictions on Spain, Italy. Oh. Come on, Luther, start with you. Work left to right. I think it will be Italy in 90 minutes. What did Italy we agree? 90. We agreed that we're going to say Spain. One goal, a few Just goals. Just one goal. Just the one goal. Mina, there's a lot of, lot of 1-0 predictions either we've after got extra it, time We've got to let the viewers know what we think. <laughs> yeah, you've got to be honest. You've got to be honest. I wanted you to go and give the kiss of death. Oh. Never mind. Um, I don't really want to give a prediction. But I, <laughs> I really, really, really don't. But I'm going to say Painful. Spain because... Because they're world European champions. Yeah, but I just I don't want to give a prediction. No, Angus, 
What do you think? I presume Spain are heavy well, favourites, are they? With the, they're, the they're, they're heavy favourites, but they're not as you know they're not unbackable. I mean, you know that you, you can you can back them at four to seven to win the trophy at any time, or five to four to win the match in ninety minutes. Yeah, I've just got this feeling that I mean I might be wrong, but I think they're going to start with Torres, and I think he's going to score, and I think Spain will win in ninety minutes if he does. If they don't, and they play the other way, I think we're going to have extra time, and it might go against them. I think he's going to gamble. Torres I think he's might going play to go like a fifty million pound striker next season as well, if he, with that confidence. And England to win two thousand and fourteen. Are we? You know, yes. Quick Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Of what we've seen from the four four two and the definitely the, it's the, the, the no yeah. the no possession strategy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The no they've, they've, got to, <laughs> they've got to qualify first. I mean, they should do, but Ukraine are in the group. And I know. I know you say about no possession. Do you know? Do you know how many goals are scored by having no possession before you score it? Because usually, when the ball changes hands quickly. And that's often when Win the ball, come. yeah. Gomez will test Guys, the of that. Yeah. We'll, we will talk long and hard about England and the optimism and runs abound in the country and all that. Come on, England! <laughs> we can guarantee that Spain or, or Italy will probably do well at the next tournament because they keep doing well at the tournament. It's been a pleasure hosting the Eurozone show with these guys. Guys, thank you. Uh, we'll hopefully catch up with you soon in other forms. Um, so that's it for our final Eurozone show. Thank you for being with us and goodbye for now. <laughs>